Good evening and welcome to the September 20th, 2012 meeting of the Northampton City Council. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and we'll begin tonight's meeting as always with a public comment session. Um, I have a um, sign up sheet and we would ask folks to identify yourself by name and address. Um, and we have a three minute timer over my shoulder and we would ask uh, speakers to please respect the three minute time limit. The first speaker signed up this evening is Sharon Carlson. Yes, my name is Sharon Carlson. I live at 56 Market Street in Northampton. I am also the president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. I'm here this evening because I received a notice last night at 7 o'clock that you may be voting on implementing chapter of the general laws, chapter 32B, section 21 through 23. Um, I believe that in Northampton, because of the years of not having a lot of money, our insurance has been our only benefit. And with 32B, section 21 through 23, I believe that you circumvent the collective bargaining process. And I believe that for all my members. I would truly hope and has believed that over the years, the AIC, which is the Insurance Advisory Committee that we have in Northampton, has worked with the mayors the previous mayor and uh, Mayor Nakowitz last year on changing plan design so to, really, uh, to bring down the insurance costs. I believe that going with 32B, section 21 through 23, that you will circumvent the collective bargaining process and reduce our ability to have any type of long-term benefits in this city. I believe through this, the, the years, the loyalty of the teachers, the ESPs, the custodians, the secretaries, and other administrators in the school department have shown their willingness to reduce funds. But attacking our insurance is not the way to go. Thank you very much. Okay, the next speaker is Alicia Rao. Alicia Ralph. I live at 755 West Hampton Road. And the reason I came here tonight is to let you know that the Reuse Committee had a great Saturday where we collected rigid plastic, bikes for bikes for bikes, not bombs, and uh, textiles for the Salvation Army. And our next event is September 29th, where we'll be collecting <coughs> durable medical equipment. Things like wheelchairs, walkers, crutches and um, other things that um, will be much better used by the Stavros Center, which is going to collect them. And um, let's see, uh, also on the 29th, you can turn in your sharps and your expired meds or any kind of meds you want to know questions asked. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next uh, speaker who signed up is uh, Roy C. Martin. <coughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, uh, Mr. Mayor. Right? Uh, tonight I come before you because, uh, you know, I had a couple of issues that, you know, I just can't seem to get my head around. Uh, they're talking about putting another hotel down on Conn Street next to the Gazette building. You know, uh, I think we are pretty well overly stacked with hotels in the city. Uh, most of the hotels, I don't believe, are 50 percent, 60 percent at most. And uh, another hotel, right? It doesn't mean that much more hotel taxes coming in. So I can't see any reason why we'd want another hotel in the city. We just voted against one out here, and and that one there is gone. Now the other reason I come tonight, right? Seems like I'm on the committee for disabilities, and. You know, we've been talking about a few issues, and we've been talking about Braille menus and stuff like that. Now we've got around to talking about handicap access to different buildings. Well, it seems like the issue came up that right here in, in this chamber, right, it isn't handicap accessible to wheelchairs. Uh, you know, a friend of mine, right, uh, I won't mention his name, but uh, he chairs the committee, and you know he is totally in a wheelchair, 
and he's come up to this door many a time, and he's had to have people come and open the doors for him because he can't get in the door. And, uh, you know, if there was push buttons to get in the door, and, you know, there's other places, there's several other places in the city which, uh, you know, if I get the authorization, I'll go and I'll talk with them, and I'll probably take him right along with me because he is in a wheelchair, and he does make a statement. And, uh, uh, you know, people in wheelchairs and people on crutches, people with canes, right, you know, uh, have a lot of trouble in the city. So let's smarten up, let's wise up, let's do something about it. I mean, you know, simple little thing like push buttons to open the doors, right? Very easy. You know, I can see an easy way for that. Now, right, that's up to you, Mr. Mayor, to... See that it's done? All right. I'll leave it in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, uh, next speaker is Jasper Lapiansky. I'm Jasper Lapiansky. I live in Ward 3. And people who aren't here should have put the Elizabeth Warren debate on tape. Um, OK. So after much discussion with myself, I come before you once again to discuss the bike trail that parallels King Street. I'll admit to you up front that my spiel on this subject in July was rather rambling and hasty. This time I hope to do better. Besides, from what I've seen, the city council, the mayor, and the DPW have no interest in taking any action, so it looks like I'd better get used to talking about it. Uh, allow me briefly to jump to the subject of education. Because of federal and state mandates, Whenever the school's budgets get cut, they always cut the arts, never math or reading. This is an example of school committees making decisions based on priorities. Being unable to have everything, they will skimp on whatever has the weakest constituency, regardless of value, need, or their own morality. So it is likewise with the city council and the DPW on the issue of transportation. The cars and their drivers dominate politics and therefore also dominate policy. Their needs are met first, their issues are prioritized in times of fiscal shortfall, and as a result, when North Street is finally done, it may only have one sidewalk, but it sure as hell will have two lanes. I get the politics of it. People without cars have less money, are more likely to work during public comment sessions, and don't stay in town as long. Many are children and immigrants who couldn't vote if they wanted to and certainly won't be shelling out for campaigns. But because of this mismatch in political value, we are always at the short end of the signpost and I personally am getting tired of excuses. Money or no, and whatever the weather, there is a task at hand that must get done. To that end, I am announcing here and now the formation of Occupy the King Street Bike Path. Where the city won't act, I will, along with anyone who will join me. Uh, let's see. Uh, for those of you watching at home and in the audience, without a plow, this will be a big job. I need workers, I need donations of money and supplies, and I need a couple of fellow organizers. Send me an email and let me know what you can do. Finally, you can all help by simply calling your ward councilor and demanding action. Why is it that they somehow always find the money to plow Bridge Road? It's not an issue of money. It's an issue of political will. Um, and, and just as a side note, a water fountain in this chamber would be awesome. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lobbyan. Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak during the public comment period? Okay. If not, I will uh, close the public comment, call the order the regular meeting, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll of the city council. Here. 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 Okay, um, before we move into the regular agenda, I wanted to ask for a motion to suspend rules to allow for presentation, a uh, brief presentation by our DPW director, uh, Ned Hunt. Move to um, suspend the rule. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 And I'd like to recognize. Uh, Move to recognize Ned Huntley. Oh, it's second. Just did. It's over. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> Mr. Huntley, if you would, uh, you have the floor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I was asked to come here tonight to give a brief presentation and any discussion about an incident that occurred Tuesday night at the Woodsboro Treatment Plant. About nine o'clock, it lost power, 
and the backup generator failed to start and transfer power over. In addition, the alarms at the plant went off and the auto dialer failed to call in any emergency personnel. Personnel came in at about 6.15 in the morning and noticed the primary clarifiers were overflowing on the grounds into the Old Mill Riverbed. We released between a half million to a million gallons of <coughs> sewage. We immediately called EPA, DEP, the health director, and the mayor, and uh, got everyone up to speed. Uh, the plant immediately started by pushing one button. So uh, there's nothing really wrong with the plant per se, but for some reason we had a series of incidents that happened that caused this uh, unfortunate release to the environment. Do folks have questions? Uh, Councillor Labarge. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, so this has happened. It happened on Tuesday, Tuesday night. Tuesday night and that Wednesday storm. morning. That's correct. And staff came in at 6 o'clock in the morning. 6.15 they arrived and found the problem. And that's when they detected that there was a problem, That's correct? correct. So we don't have anybody who works that shift, third shift, ever, correct? No. Not so, that facility. Not necessarily? Not at that facility. Oh, okay. Anyways, my question is, we lost a half a million to possibly a million of storage. That's our estimate. Okay. So DEP comes in, right? Is that what they do? They've been notified, had, so they have to come in. We've had a number of phone conversations with DEP. We haven't seen them at the site. So what do they do now, Ned? What would DEP do? What's their job? Well, DEP immediately notified the state of Connecticut. Apparently, it is a, a law that they, in excess of 100,000 gallons released, they have to notify the neighboring state downstream. So they notified the state of Connecticut that we had a release that was on was ongoing, but had happened during the evening. Um, DP did not direct us to do anything more such as public health risks or advisories okay. uh, on this matter. They would have if they felt that it was an issue. And it would have been an issue if, because how much do we do without, I mean, between the three shifts, you're talking about just that shift alone was a half a million to a million possibly. So we're looking at what, six million possibly a day? Um, the plant, on average, runs at about four and a half million gallons a day. During rain events, it increases because we have some inflow issues in the city. What we don't know is how much was flowing through the plant because all the graphs went offline shortly after nine when the power went out. Mm -hmm. um, we did run the generator three times, three load tests the next morning, and it worked fine. So we're not sure if the actually the generator started at night and didn't detect a reason to be on and shut itself after five minutes, or it went off because of a ground fault. We don't know what happened there. But as the water levels rose in the headworks of the building and through the plant, the alarm started going off. They reached to the auto dialer, and the dial never went out to the personnel. So we, we have all the mechanisms in place for this, but like I said, the, the dialer didn't call out. Next morning, we called in industrial residential security to come in and look, and they spent a short period of time down there and hooked up some wires, and it works fine. Councillor Tacey. <clears throat> so, anyway, I, so we understand that we had some fail safes that somehow or other failed. That's correct. And we don't know what DEP is going to say or do, or we have no idea. They haven't really said too much. So, um, so I don't really. I know there's a lot of questions that you can't even answer, so, um, but I would hope that um, we'll be kept informed Definitely. of what's happening, uh, especially with DEP, and thank you very much. You will. Okay. Councillor uh, Dwight and then Councillor Freeman. So essentially the redundancies, and it looks like three at least, three redundancies or chain of redundancies failed in one kind of perfect storm, epic. Exactly. And, and, um, and part of the, and, and, and I and I want to understand that part of the uh, issue during a storm event, the, what you described is essentially, and maybe folks don't know, that the city also has some rather antique um, sewer lines that can actually be infiltrated with storm water that actually increases your water flow, and that creates a situation that you're referring to, the, that you experience. Yes, we have an inflow issue in the city, whereas when we get the heavy rains or extended periods of rain, the flow increases to the plant uh, dramatically. And that's because uh, sewer pipes 
old traditional sewer pipes are leaking there or they it's actually separate? more probably the downtown area we believe it's coming from uh, we're actually finishing up an inflow infiltration study as part of the comprehensive wastewater management plan and uh, we're seeing these peak within 15 minutes of these heavy rains it's at the plant and literally as soon as it stops raining it's dissipating so you know the source is local and close it's probably roof leaders of older buildings downtown things of that nature that are collecting this extra storm water this discharge of effluence in your estimation took place in a relatively short time um, actually the headworks of the building had to fill up first and so there's a volume in there that filled up first and then you had the three primary clarifiers that have about 12 or 13 feet of headroom space on them before they overflow so <coughs> a bit of water was retained that's why our estimate was a half million to a million and not greater than that because we retain quite a bit uh, no floatables left the plant they stayed in the headworks and the sludge blanket stayed in the primary clarifiers so that didn't release so it was really more sewage water rainwater that left the plant and it flows into the old mill river bed uh, like i said that was part of the mill river diversion of 1940 and there's about 700 acres of water when rains goes down to that point at flood control so there's quite a bit of dilution of this also that moved through the flood control wall out to the Connecticut River eventually. And so these these failed systems, you, you guys haven't done the forensics on this yet, so you don't necessarily know what I mean, what accounted for a triple failure. Um, if it's equipment failure, if it was something that we didn't anticipate in in, in establishing those systems, I mean, did they fail because of a chain? I mean, are they we, we, we don't know yet. The like I said, the the generator we test on a regular basis. The last uh, manual test we ran was in late February this uh, last month. Um, the next morning, Wednesday morning, we load tested it three times in a row, and it performed flawlessly. So we don't know what happened that night in particular. Like I said, it's either a ground fault, or it turned on and sensed it didn't need to be on for whatever reason and. It automatically shuts off in about five minutes. And what would, it, and what in your estimation would account for the absence of the, uh, the, the toning of the emergency personnel? Um, there was some work done in the previous week at the plant on intrusion alarms, which use the same phone systems. So that is a suspect, but we can't specifically say that was the reason. Okay, thank you, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Was there any damage to the facility or there is. equipment? There is. We're in the process of uh, pulling uh, motors out and having them cleaned and cleaned and baked, they're called, and put back into service again. The plant is fully operational. We're taking these motors. The plant has some redundancy motors in it. So we're taking these out one by one. They're being sent down to Springfield. They're being cleaned and brought back into service, usually in a, a 24 to 36 hour period for each motor. So we've begun that process of cleaning the plant down. Thanks. Councilor LaBarge. Ned, on this equipment failure, how old is this equipment? Uh, this equipment is roughly 32, 33 years old, most of it. Thank you. Are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Huntley? Thank you, and just to reiterate, we will be obviously keeping the council and the public informed as this moves forward. And uh, thank you again for coming tonight to uh, just to give the council and the public uh, an update on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll now return to the regular order of the meeting. And uh, before you, you have the approval of your minutes of August 16th, 2012. Move to approve. Second. Is there any discussion of the amendment of those uh, minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next, uh, under minutes, uh, there we have the uh, quarterly review by the council president and city solicitor of executive sessions. And I'll turn this over to the council president. It, and in fact, actually, we mentioned this the last time we, uh, we opened up some executive session minutes. There was some, uh, uh, there was one, one set of minutes that we held while this suit was still pending relative to the, the already mentioned hotel development that was back here that has now since been settled and consequently the uh is, is the city solicitor's opinion in my opinion that they now qualify for public release 
So, um, and I, now, of course, I've forgotten the process. Does that require us to accept them? This is the confusing part because, right. This is uh, still one of the issues yeah, just so they just that, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to grapple with right. um, because many of the, sometimes we have minutes that are old that people are no longer on the council that were part of the minute process. So, so um, if all the councilors will say three times, I accept this, I accept this, I accept <laughs> yeah. this, then we'll consider the. So I think what we've typically done is just release them there. as they are at this point. So now Chad can have a look at them exactly. if he would like. Okay. Yeah. So those are now released and will be available. And available to the public. Okay. Okay. The next item on the agenda is uh, proclamations, resolutions, awards, and recognitions. And we do have a resolution this evening. Uh, this is uh, uh, September 20th, 2012. This is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and City Council President William H. Dwight. Ordered that whereas Sojourner Truth, although born into slavery, became one of the most prominent Americans working for the abolition of slavery and for women's suffrage, and whereas her fame exceeded the terrestrial in 1997, when the U.S. launched a roving probe on Mars with a wheeled robotic component named Sojourner after a year-long worldwide contest in which each student named a heroine and submitted an essay about her historical accomplishments. And whereas Sojourner Truth lived in the Florence section of Northampton, where she worked with the Northampton Association of Education and Industry, gracing the town with her speeches and other work on behalf of justice. And whereas Northampton is historically significant in her life because it is where Sojourner Truth bought her first home and where she published her famous autobiography. And whereas 10 years ago, a group of Northampton citizens came together to commission and erect a memorial to this great American, and they presented this statue as a lasting gift to the future generations of Northampton, and whereas the mayor and city council, on behalf of the city of Northampton, were grateful then and remain so one decade later for the dedication and continuing hard work of this grassroots committee, now therefore be it resolved that the Northampton City Council acknowledges formally the 10th anniversary of the design, casting, and placement of the landscaped Sojourner Truth Memorial statue at the intersection of Pine and Park Streets in Florence, and be it further resolved that the, citizens, that the Northampton City Council acknowledges formally the value of this memorial project for all citizens of Northampton, our children, and all justice-seeking people everywhere throughout the past decade and onward into our future. Move to approve. Second. Is there discussion? Council President as one of the sponsors. And we actually have some folks here to receive this today, but the, um, um, and I'm just looking up on the internet, of course, it was 1863, of course, the Emancipation Proclamation was declared, and that will be, next year will be that anniversary celebration. The fact that, and it mentions in this resolution that 10 years ago citizens got together to erect this actually truth be told is much longer than 10 years ago that citizens got together to uh, a lot of dedicated um, community people wanted to acknowledge not only the the presence but the ethic and the legacy of sojourner truth and worked very hard to raise the money to erect what is I think by all accounts now I I uh, the, I have never heard anything to the contrary, a rather stunning uh, memorial to Sojourner Truth. And for that, I, I'm, I think this is the, the least we can do to express our gratitude and also to reaffirm our, our, uh, our community pride on the fact that Sojourner Truth walked these streets and uh, set an example for us all. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Um, I'm honored with this resolution. I know Councillor Paul Spector, Councillor Maureen Carney, and I were really, as councillors, involved of what was going on with that committee. And also, when we had the dedication, previous councillors that are not here now were also involved. She's just a, like a mentor. She worked so hard, and she was acknowledged for what she had done. You even had children in the 
in the school systems who actually drew pictures of her way back, okay, who honored her. And it's a woman that I feel that that statue, right there where it's at, is one of the best places to be because it's what she's done for the city of Northampton and Florence. And that statue took a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of money involved, and it's an honor. It's just an honor with this resolution. Councilor Tacey. Yeah, um, I remember very well all the little cans and things in various stores throughout the city that had, uh, were collecting change for, to erect this, this, this statue, this, this memorial. And um, even before they really even knew what it was gonna look like, before there was even a design. Um, and it sits right in my ward. It's, uh, it's a testament to the generosity of the community at large. And um, they wanted this to go forward and, uh, and it was a lot of work from a lot of people. I don't even wanna mention anybody's name because you know you'll forget somebody. Um, but uh, a lot of people put a lot of heart and soul into this, and uh, I, I can I appreciate it very much, and thank you. It's, it's a beautiful memorial, beautiful. Thank you. Are there other counselors who wish to speak on this uh, this resolution? Okay, so um, it's a, it's actually a resolution as a, it's a resolution. proclamation. So right. we, we vote on it. And, and it has been moved, I believe, right? Yes, it's been so, second. So, for all those in favor of, uh, of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so this passes unanimously on first reading. And, and uh, do two readings for, on it? we could certainly do two readings if we want. So right. Whatever the pleasure is. I'd like to make a motion to suspend rule 14. 14. 14. Is there a second? Second. second. Those in favor of suspending rule say aye. 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 Opposed? I'd like to move the second reading, please. Move to approve. Second. Okay, so we're now on second reading. Uh, just a, a comment, just a, and, and I don't, uh, as I said, there were people here to receive this um, resolution slash proclamation, so that, that we're not, I hope that once on acceptance, we have an opportunity to present it. Uh, we can, though I will have to say that we have to have the enrollment committee sign it. I have to sign it. It has to be enrolled. So we can certainly um, we can certainly present it, but we also have to. Excuse me. Right. Could we if, suspend those? If, uh, no. Those, point of order. Those, that's right. Point of order. For the city clerk, will have us. Uh, yeah. Point of order, Mr. Yes. If we. Um, they can speak before sure, we can certainly order. present it to them and, and they could and they, if, if and, any of them um, if we could just have it back then so we can finalize it and we'll give you a formal copy but we would certainly love to present it to you formally yeah so why don't we take the second reading vote we can do a presentation and then we just did okay. okay so all those in favor on second reading say aye aye, aye. opposed okay so would you like to introduce our, uh, uh the reverend peter ives uh is here and Reverend you have some folks with you you might want to introduce if you could just come and step up and give any words thank you very much for passing this resolution it means a lot to all of us I have with me Terry O'Toole who's the uh, current um, pre president and chair of the Sojourner Truth Statue Committee uh, just elected um, a few months ago and his wife Sarita who is a uh, going to be teaching African American Studies at Smith College next semester and is a PhD student at Harvard University. Uh, and we come reflecting the Sojourner Truth Statue Committee. I also, Terry, wanted to say that um, we have been working on a, a book um, that is called Honoring Truth, the Sojourner Statue Story, 1992 to 2012. And this will be released at the First Churches this uh, week from this Sunday uh, during what we call the Sojourner Jubilee, uh, when uh, we will have um, Roche Barnes give the keynote address from, from Smith College um, about Sojourner. But then we're going to have members of the original committee um, back in 1992 and three um, do a panel discussion at First Churches about this book. But what this book contains is uh, the entire story that was told about Sojourner, the Sojourner statue um, by the Daily Hampshire Gazette and by the Union News 
uh, by the New York Times and all the newspapers that were covering the story. So we will be selling this book, and it, it, it tells the whole story of, of, of what happened uh, using all of the pictures and the uh, articles from the Daily Hampshire Gazette uh, to do it. And, and so it's an amazing story. It's just an amazing story. And it, it really started with a proclamation by uh, your predecessors here when Mary Ford was, was our mayor. Um, and you basically started this back in 1993 with, with a proclamation that we have right here in the book. And we were hoping you'd do your second reading tonight, Bill, um, so that we could put this uh, resolution in the book before it gets published by Steve Strymer um, <laughs> next uh, Monday. Uh, so if you could move it along, Mayor. It'll be done uh, tomorrow. We would, we would <laughs> really tomorrow. like to have it in this book. But I, 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 from Terry and all of us on the committee, uh, and um, we have people who go back to 1992, uh, uh, we can't thank you enough. And, uh, and, and we had the support of the city council right through this whole process. It wasn't always easy. We, we had to work hard, and there were some controversies. But we've tried to tell the whole story in this book. And we will uh, give you, Mr. Mayor, uh, a copy of this book uh, uh, as, as soon Thank as you. we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. In exchange for the resolution. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Reverend. Yes, violation. Mayor. Counselor. Could you find out? what date it is that we could get that book uh could you just repeat the date for the public of when the jubilee will be happening oh it's uh, uh, sunday a week from this sunday on september 30th at first churches from two o'clock to four o'clock and what's the price on the book twenty dollars that's cheap and all the proceeds from the book will go to fund the sojourner truth statute committee and the scholarships they always give three scholarships uh, every every year in in May to high school students from Northampton High School or Amherst High School um, that are that are used for students who have completed some project that reflects the whole spirit of Sojourner Truth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any one minute announcements, Councillor Spector? Yes. Um, Next week, this is Thursday, September 27th, at the JFK Community Room at 7 o'clock. I'll announce this again. The, the City Council and the Board of Public Works uh, Conference Committee will be sponsoring a meeting on, essentially it's going to be, and we heard this uh, this evening, it was kind of, I guess it's not serendipitous that we had this problem, but it's the meeting is about the future of our uh, flood control and um, facilities and our stormwater facilities. and. It's to begin to have a discussion with the public about what has been mandated, what are some of the critical pro other critical capital projects that need to be done. And so I really encourage people to please come to this meeting. Again, it is next Thursday, the 27th at JFK, from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Okay. Councillor LaBarge. Councillor um, Spector, is this presentation being strictly being done by the Board of Public Works? No, this is actually being the conference committee and the, the meeting will be chaired by the council president. It's a, it's a council meeting where the Board of Pub Public Works will be present to answer questions and provide some information. So and this meeting is really about, it, it is basically just an overview of what the city is facing in terms of some of the very large long-term projects that are coming down the pike so people begin to understand what some of the, the mandates and requirements are that we deal with on our stormwater and our flood control system. So all of us counselors are to be there? I, I would encourage all of you to come. It's, it's, this will not be a meeting that will have a vote. Okay. It doesn't even require deliberation. The purpose of this is, of course, we've known historically that um, the community often feels that they come up short on information when, when major decisions are made uh, relative to fees and that, that are not necessarily governed by um, tax votes. And uh, despite the fact that the Board of Public Works works to try and do as much outreach as they can, this is our, this is us weighing in and saying, here's an opportunity because we, we really do, I think we are at a critical juncture and we have some critical challenges facing us that, that the community has to understand in order even to think about having buy-in 
the community has to understand the scope of the circumstances that are facing us and this is the purpose of this meeting is an opportunity for community members with any questions or just to uh, it's an educational uh, process the idea is we're going to be educated as well is to have a better understanding about the challenges that we're going to be facing and they're not only fiduciary challenges they're challenges of of literally the 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 viability of the infrastructure of the city so it's it's and very important that people come councillor dwight also too i've attended 8 30 meetings in the morning on this whole issue here mm -hmm. plus another one at the board of public works my question is that's not going to be the only hearing no 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 this is in fact this is an introduction okay this is an introduction and by the way as i said there will be no votes okay. we're not deciding anything we're this is inviting the community to participate in the conversation and it's educational and there will be the intent of from what i understand from the 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 conference committee is to have a series of meetings because there's a lot to digest here yes the, uh, thank you I would encourage other counselors to come because there, this is, as, as uh, Council President said, these are really large projects. These are going to really affect the whole city. And I think it's important for all the counselors to understand stand the scope of what we are facing in terms of stormwater and flood control and what's being mandated. So. Right. Counselor. And that's what made it very difficult for a lot of people at 8.30 in the morning. Well, that's why we're doing it at 7 o'clock. You know, I mean, 8.30 in the morning, and yeah. we did have some people on my ward who did attend right. that. Well, that's why we're doing 7 o'clock. You know, yeah. right. I'm just letting you know that. That was a problem. Councilor. I have another, another announcement, which is congratulations to Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels on uh, his... Uh, <laughs> a troll? A troll thing. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Are there any other announcements? Okay. Hearing none, I will move on in the meeting. Uh, we'll now move to appointments, uh, elections, and public hearings. Uh, we do have an 8 p.m. Uh, petition hearing, but we'll have to move beyond that because we're not at 8 o'clock yet. So we'll move on to um, appointments. And before you, you have a new appointment to the Council on Aging. Uh, this is uh, James P. Spencer. Uh, he will be replacing Henry Kowalski um, for a term to expire uh, April 2015. Is there a uh, move to approve? Move to approve. Move to approve. This is actually okay, coming. It's already back. come back. Yeah. So there's a motion to approve. Second. Seconded. <laughs> and then I would ask the chair of appointments and evaluations to come. As you know, what we try and do is to. Uh, where, where it works easily, especially for the person who is a candidate, we try and have them come in and we interview the candidate. There are occasions where if we have a letter of support or if members of the committee can get hold of the candidate and we, we try and streamline this as easy as possible for someone who is volunteering. And in this particular case, we not only have a letter from the director of the Council on Aging, uh, Patty Shaughnessy, uh, but also Council Labarge has a few things to say for the council. But we, um, so let me just read the letter from, from Patty. James Spencer would be a welcome addition to the Northampton Council on Aging Board. He has been a very active member of the Council on Aging and Senior Center and is a strong advocate who supports the mission of the Council on Aging. Mr. Spencer has been a volunteer with the Council since March 2003. He has taught writing, photography, computer classes, and assisted the Council on Aging to organize a bike club. He also writes articles and stories routinely for our Elder Vision newspaper publication. In the upcoming months, Jim will be organizing a very creative fundraising event that will financially benefit the Senior Center and draw more participants to the Center. So with a letter like that, I want to encourage other members of the Council to move this forward and accept this candidate. Council LaBarge. Yes, um, I did talk with Mr. Spencer on the phone. We had a lengthy talk, and he is extremely energetic. There's no question about it. What I did was I asked him to email me all the things that he thought that he could bring as a new member there 
at the Council on Aging. So I copied them all. Each one of you counselors do have it on your desk. And I just want to go over a couple of things about Mr. Spencer. He's a very energetic individual. He has a reputation for bringing creative solutions to problems to a team table. He can plan major events involving multiple levels of cooperation. He can work with diverse groups having different levels of education, experience, and motivation. He can work with strict guidelines and financial constraints. He will bring fresh ideas to the council, not reasons why something can't be accomplished or why something won't work. He will ask why and work to make ideas work. One idea that he talked about for the Council on Aging was to sponsor a Meet the Authors Fair. And I think he has a really creative imagination of helping to make money at the Senior Center. He would schedule this in mid to early spring when the craft fairs are not as popular at other times of the year. What would fair cost of? He would gather a number of local authors that would be willing to play, willing to pay a fee for a table where they could sell their books and meet their local readers. So I think what he is talking about is charging $25 <coughs> a table, and he's hoping to get a good amount of authors to come in. So that is what you call having creative ideas and helping the Council on Aging of making some money. So I, I'm supporting this resident. I, I think he will be excellent for the Council on Aging. Councillor Tacey. Yeah, I've known uh, Jim Spencer and his family all my life. Um, I think he'd be a, a great asset to the board. I, and, I, and I also uh, would like to thank Henry Kowalski for all of his time on the board. He's an excellent member of the Council on Aging. and. Uh, uh, I know we'll, I'll miss him, um, and Henry had, uh, they, these are big shoes for Jim Spencer to fill, so we'll see how it works out, and I, I have all the faith in the world in Jim Spencer, he's a great guy. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions about what this Councilor Thank you. Thank uh, you. I really, uh, I, you know, I've made quite a few comments about uh, approving appointments and so on in the past, and I really appreciate the uh, diligence that uh, and, the, and the documentation that's gone into this uh, uh, this appointee I don't know the, um, the the gentleman in question but I I am very encouraged by both seeing his words uh, in black and white and also a letter of support um, I, I, I hope that uh, we can continue this trend of, uh, of, of good documentation for uh, for appointees I'm, I'm he seems like an excellent candidate Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, this, uh, all those in favor of the appointment say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent, congratulations, Mr. Spencer. Okay, we're still not quite at 8 o'clock yet, uh, so we'll need to continue on with the meeting. Um, let's go ahead and recess for the Finance Committee, and uh, I will ask the clerk to call the roll of the Finance Committee. Present. Here. Present. Here. Here. Okay, so this evening we have three financial orders in the Finance Committee that we need to take up. Uh, the first is a, this is upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development, the Conservation Commission, and the Finance Committee ordered that, whereas on, uh, on February 20th, 1964, Chapter 40, Section 8C of the Massachusetts General Laws authorizing a conservation commission was accepted by the City Council, and whereas under Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 8C, quote, 
Said commission may receive gifts, bequests, or devises of personal property or interest in real property of the kinds mentioned below in the name of the city or town, subject to the approval of the city council in a city or the selectmen in a town. It may purchase interest in such land with sums available to it. If insufficient funds are available or other reasons so require, a city council or a town meeting may raise or transfer funds so that the commission may acquire in the name of the city or town by option, purchase, lease, or otherwise the fee in such land or water rights, conservation restrictions, easements, or other contractual rights, including conveyances on conditions or with limitations or reversions as may be necessary to acquire maintain, improve, protect, limit the future use of, or otherwise conserve and properly utilize open spaces in land and water areas within its city or town, and it shall manage and control the same, close quote, and whereas in accordance with Mass General Law, chapter 40C, section 8C, the city has established a conservation fund to accept gifts and donations and hold funds, now therefore be it ordered that City Council authorizes the Conservation Commission through its agent, the Office of Planning and Development, to accept donations and gifts to the conservation funds and to expend funds for the purchase of land and interests in land for open space purchases authorized by City Council, including conservation land and multi-use trails, for the maintenance and improvements to such open space and trails, and for any other purpose authorized by Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 8C. Is there a motion in uh, in Finance Committee uh, to recommend? Recommend. Sure, second it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Fiden is here, <coughs> Director of the Office I of Planning. I to recognize them. Okay, second. Is second? Uh, all those in favor, uh, say aye. Aye. Okay, Mr. Fiden. So, we, we've actually had this fund for several decades. Uh, the city is a new city solicitor. Um, and he thinks that all gift accounts need to be specifically approved by city council before we can spend money from them. So we've had this fund. Whenever we buy land, we typically do a substantial fundraising operation. Um, you've all seen that, you know, we come to you several times a year for acquisitions. We use this fund so that we do fundraising, monies come into the fund, and then we can then use them to purchase the property. So typically the funds in this are used to match other, for very small acquisitions we might buy from this fund totally, but usually these funds are used to match CPA funds and to match state and federal grants. Um, so the money in the fund, you know, someone donates to us, the money is, is donated generally for a specific property, although some people donate just for us to acquire land generally. Um, and then after we acquire property, the first thing we do is bring the property up to date and make sure, you know, we check properties for trash and if there's structures in the property, remove them, um, get rid of some invasives in the property and survey. So this supports both the acquisitions and some of those improvements we need to make to the property. Are there any uh, questions about this in the Finance Committee or from other sponsors? Okay. So again, we're essentially trying to make sure that we're complying fully with Mass General Law when it comes to the acceptance of these kinds of uh, gifts. Okay. And the expenditure. And the expenditure. Okay. Okay. Uh, hearing no questions about this in the Finance Committee, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The next order is uh, upon the recommendation of Office and Planning Development and the Finance Committee. Be it ordered that, whereas the city has established a, quote, tourism gift account, unquote, administered by the Office of Planning and Development to allow the city to accept donations to make Northampton more attractive, and whereas past and current projects have ranged from Interstate 91 signage for Northampton, design of gateway signs to the city, and an artistic wayfinding sign to be installed on the Main Street Rail Trail Bridge. Now therefore be it ordered that the City Council authorizes the city, acting through its Office of Planning and Development, to accept donations and gifts to the tourism gift account and to expend such funds for artistic wayfinding signs and purposes in support of making Northampton more attractive for which the donations were earmarked and accepted. 
Is there a motion, motion to recommend? Second. And I'd like to recognize. Okay, and he's already been formally recognized, so fine. So similar comment again would be for you because this, the city solicitor says that you need to approve all these accounts. If you remember, we came before you maybe three or four months ago and did a joint presentation for the project on the Main Street Bridge and the Gateway Committee project. At the time, we didn't ask for this authorization because we didn't realize we needed this action. So now we're before you for, for now. The only funds we have right now are for this, this bridge. So that's what the money we're going to. But obviously, we're asking for authority so that if somebody comes, we, we get, we, we've used this funds in the past for various purposes. So if you come up I-91 to Northampton just before exit 18, you'll see six signs on a row there that are for different tourism type things, Calvin Theater, Arts District. We used that fund in the past. We did a fundraising campaign to pay for that. So it allows us, if someone says, I want to give money to the city for a bench and a bike path, or I want to give money for some activity, it allows us to accept those funds and spend them the way the donor intended them to be spent. Councillor Labarge and then Tacey. Wayne, I'm really confused with this. On the tourism gift account, the Board of Public Works, because I know I'm going through this on my ward right now, they also have a tourism sign policy where if you have a sign that's been there for so long, now they have to have that sign taken off and pay almost a $500 fee to have a new tourism sign placed. So explain to me the difference of what this gift account is versus what the Board of Public Works is doing with the tourism sign policy. Sure. We have two things here, and my question is, why are you not combining? So very different things, similar names, I think, which probably makes it complicated. But you know, the, the specific project we're doing right now is on Main Street, on the bike path bridge, is putting in a, we're calling an artistic wayfinding sign. This began as an effort to encourage people from Main Street, particularly tourism, but tourists, but hopefully residents as well, to sort of have an artistic backdrop to Northampton. And rather than coming to town for some event, they come and say, oh, we have a bike path. We might spend more time in Northampton. Instead of just coming for lunch, we might go for a walk on the bike path and then go downtown to eat. So it, it's basically, it can be used for any activity which is going to promote the city, which is going to make it a more tourist-friendly destination. DPW's program is totally different. So this is about, under Northampton zoning, generally don't allow off-premise signs. Um, so you can only do a sign right on your property itself. The one exception is a sign which is, in, which is installed by the city so that a city agency is saying, yes, the sign's important for, for information purposes. And those signs vary from everything from you know, speed limit 30 up to the sort of tourism signs that you're talking about. So Board of Public Works spent a couple of years studying the, po the their policy and decided there's some businesses, Jim's Variety Store being an example, that aren't, they're important businesses and aren't visible on a, on a major street, and so they were allowing some signs there. Um, right, which was older signs. And this is where I'm having a problem here. We have a resident who has for instance, the Hickory Dell Farm. Okay, all of a sudden that sign was missing and I had to deal with the Board of Public Works on the tourism signs and they did find it at the Board of Public Works and the owners were never notified that they had it and here they went through the process way back through the board and Councilor Jim Dasta way back when he was on the board helped them go through the process because the state said it's not a state road, that this is a town road. So they went through the process. So because the sign apparently was taken down somehow and leaning against the tourism sign, this family now has to pay a $400 fee plus $50 a year for maintenance, and it's, it's not making sense. I don't know the answer to that. That's nothing to do with That's a totally separate project. Well, this is what I'm it. saying. We're talking about a tourism gift account, and we're talking about a tourism policy at the Board of Public Works. Why is this not combined? Okay, I think they're different things, though. I think theirs is about a policy for signs. And it's also ordering signs and placing them. Right. But this is really about 
gift account that allows the city to accept gifts for things that encourage tourism and allows us to like spend Like people money. giving you money for a sign? That's correct. So, you know, if, for example, 40 citizens wanted to get together to contribute money for that kind of sign, the money could come into this fund and we could use it for that. We've never had somebody offering that kind of thing. We get, you know, unsolicited donations and solicited donations from time to time for various projects. But if I could just, you're also, though, that the other distinction is you're not placing it in the right of way of, you know, the, the signs that Councillor Labarge is talking about are in the city's right of way, That's which correct. are controlled by the Board of Public Works and have to pass through that. So it's a little bit different. That's correct. So, but the gateway that I'm on, the beautification program, yeah. that is on city property. Right. And that's, that's not primarily because they're doing their fundraising privately. It's not part of the city. Right. But you're saying that it can be placed on private ways, correct? If it, right, so signs which are which are installed by government agency or in the direction of government agency are allowed in places. The gateway signs. Okay, them. thank you. Uh, Councillor Freeman Daniels and then Councillor Tacy. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I know that I'm not a member of this committee, but uh, I would like to say that I, I have a real problem with this order, um, and uh, I'd like to suggest to the committee that it makes an amendment before it accepts it. Uh, or re before recommended to the, to the council. Uh, my problem with it is um, that it seems to me that there's really two orders here, or actually one uh, open door order and then a, six, a, a series of, of actually, un, I don't know how many uh, approvals that uh, the council would be granting tonight and if we, if, if we approved it as written. And, and here's how I read it. The actual order is doing two things. It's accepting gifts, which requires council approval, that's state law, and allowing the expenditure of funds, which also requires council approval, again, from state law. So I, I don't have any problem accepting gifts. <laughs> <I'll just>, uh, <laughs> if someone wants to give the city money, that's, that's great. Um, but I do have an, a problem with an open-ended approval for spending these donations, um, especially because, as uh, Director Fiden just pointed out, there are uh, sometimes there are um, unsolicited gifts, and sometimes there are solicited gifts. Uh, distinguishing between the two is important, I think, but also it matters that the solicited gifts have appropriate public process and public input. And of course, if we accept that all gifts can be used, right? If we accept it right now there won't be necessarily any requirement for public process and public input. And that's just on the solicited gifts. The unsolicited gifts are just as dangerous. Uh, we, had a, we had a conversation at the last meeting about uh, someone giving the city uh, $5,000 to do speed humps. We did have a public process in place on that one. We don't have one for this. Uh, so I think there's a real problem here. And, I would, and so I think that it's really important to separate the two orders. One. Absolutely, the city should be authorized, the city council should authorize the Office of Planning and Development or any other, any other board to accept gifts and donations to the city. But I believe that if the board, if the Office of Planning and Development or any other uh, office in the city wants to expend those gifts, they should have an, a, an appropriate plan. They should have uh, to come before council about that specific expenditure and give us a specific outline about what they're planning on doing. And we have to be satisfied, the council should be satisfied that it's a sufficiently public process before those gifts are expended. Mm -hmm. And so I would recommend to the, to the committee, and I'm gonna recommend, by the way, to the committee on the next one as well, that um, this be uh, split and in effect actually be the, the last part of the order be deleted, starting with the and on the second line uh, right after tourism gift account, that everything after that be deleted and a period be put after gifts to the tourism gift, gift account. And then, as Director Fiden said, because we, we, there's a wayfinding uh, uh, project, which they have made a presentation about, which needs to be, fu needs to be authorized to be funded, that uh, OPD comes back with a separate order asking the council to, to authorize the expenditure of the funds from this account for that wayfinding project. I, don't, I think that this is too 
mushed into one, and I am very much against this order. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Tacey. Yeah. <laughs> Just spewed it all out. I'll, uh, <laughs> nothing else to say, but there needs to be some process, some public process in these expenditures. Um, we kicked it around, we kicked it around in transportation and parking on, with speed humps. And um, this is exactly what came up. Um, so I'll let it lie. Uh, Councillor, um, okay. Councillor Dwight. I'm just going to, uh, uh, Wayne, you clearly want to respond to that, so I'm, I'm just, I'm taking my place on the floor to allow you to respond <laughs> to that. So. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, um, I, according to Alan Seawood's the solicitor, we do not need council approval to accept donations. So, I I if you do this amendment, you might as well just vote against it, because we, we don't need that, we have the ability to accept donations. So, the whole point here is the authority to spend funds. Um, so then there's two parts of the authority to spend. Need, just to be clear, yeah. we need uh, authorization to accept gifts of prop of real property and gifts of, uh, but the understanding was grants and cash to gifts to the city. You know, if someone walks into the collector's office and says, I want to write an extra, add an extra zero to my tax bill, we don't have to come to the city council to get approval. But if it's, but if they say, I want to donate this, you know, Rolls Royce to the city, or I want to donate a whatever it is, mm -hmm. then you have to bring that forward, so. Yeah. So if you did want to amend this, and obviously I'm going to argue against it, but if you did want to amend it, then certainly the whole point for us is to allow us to do this wayfinding sign program. Because, you know, we've been receiving gifts for this bridge that we've already presented to you, and so we'd like the ability to spend those funds. So if you want to narrow it down, that's something we've already presented to you. We've already been to multiple city committees um, for doing it. I, I, obviously, the disadvantage for coming before you for each project for gifts is um, if somebody's going to give us $50,000 or $5,000, we're, you know, we're going to come to council and it's a big process. The problem is many of the people who want to give us gifts want to give us $50 or $100 for you know, Memorial Branch or some sort of thing. And, and frankly, if we have to come to council for each one of those, it's, you know, you're talking about by the time you pay for staff to come and lose three hours of time, it wouldn't be worth doing it. And so this allows us to accept those things going forward. But, but I certainly agree there's two points. One is funding specifically for the bridge across Main Street and the related cost to that. And then second is future projects. Um, I'm going to take the privilege of still having the floor. So that, um, would you be adverse to a, the establishment of a threshold um, clearly, fifty dollars coming before us of fifty dollars requests for approval that probably would be onerous. But uh, a certain threshold, and I don't know what that threshold would be, and I don't know if, if the council would even consider that. But but um, but with, with a certain expenditure over a certain amount, it would require authorization and approval from the council. Th threshold will be fine, but if, if you know, I'm understanding that, that for the two people who have commented, the issue is about public process. Every single one of these projects goes through various committees. So transportation and parking gets involved with many of these bike and ped, conservation commission, recreation commission. So that, so in the other, I mean, a threshold will be fine, but the other way to do it is that there has to be some public process before a committee, before it gets spent. The, the reason I say this, for instance, um, the, the first example that comes to mind, of course, is actually one of what the, the bike trail, the, the opposite side of the bridge mural, met with some controversy and some disapproval, and principally focused on the absence of the, of the more formal discussion or public discussion. Um, and, and I understand the circumstances that lent itself to that, but the fact is that this would uh, allow a situation like that, while it would be more difficult, more challenging for projects to be developed, but at the same time, it does it does address uh, Council Freeman Daniels' concern about you know a public approval or a, a public discussion about approval and authorization for funds at this level. Yeah. Council Murphy, I might suggest we just as finance move this forward without a recommendation to the council, and then if a member of the council wants to attempt to amend it at that point, they can. Okay. And could I? I just I would just say speaking as a member of the Finance Committee, that another option would possibly be to um, make an amendment, uh, but but make it inclusive of the project that you want, that's currently been fundraised for and that you're hoping to accomplish, but not make it 
open-ended for any other, you know, so that would, just so that it would cover yeah. the project that has been presented to the council that we know about, and it's particularly the other one, the gateway sign project as mm -hmm. well. Those are two that have been presented. You could make it inclusive of that, so that may be an option. Um, again, speaking as a finance committee member now. Um, so there's been a motion to uh, move this forward to the full city council with no recommendation um, and then let the full council uh, deliberate on it. Is there? Um, Second that. Okay. Second. <coughs> okay, so um, all those in favor of that say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Okay. Um, so the. Um, so this is upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development and the Finance Committee. Ordered that whereas Northampton zoning requires that private development projects above certain thresholds make transportation improvements to mitigate traffic impacts that are reasonably related to the development, and whereas zoning allows developers to voluntarily make a payment in accordance with a formula in the zoning in lieu of making such improvements with the payment to cover mitigation reasonably related to the project, and whereas said funds may only be used for transportation mitigation reasonably related to the development and in accordance with any conditions imposed by the Planning Board in approving the development project, and whereas the City has established a traffic mitigation gift account administered by the Office of Planning and Development to accept said payment in lieu of transportation improvements, donations, and payments. And now, therefore, be it ordered that City Council authorizes the City, acting through its Office of Planning and Development, to accept donations, gifts, and payments to the traffic mitigation account, and further, City Council authorizes the following expenditures to the extent that funds are available to cover such expenditures. $13,797.53 for traffic calming and mitigation between Bridge Street and Hockenham Road, $10,504 and such future funds as are donated for these purposes for improvements to improve access to, development of, and maintenance of a park and ride lot at Sheldon Field and at the Veterans Administration Medical Center. $5,779.53 for planning and development of a future new or improved rail trail access from Grove Street. $46,456.32 for improved bicycle lanes and related improvements on South Street. $37,375 for improvements and new access to the Manhan Rail Trail. $183.08. $183,008 and such future funds as are donated from Lower King Street projects for a rail trail off-ramp at Edwards Square, right-of-way for rail trail <coughs> ramp access and for a rail trail underpass under the active Pan Am Railroad and design and land acquisition for the intersection of North, Summer, and King Streets. $91,040 for design of traffic mitigation in the area near the River Valley Market. $4,449.67 for traffic mitigation in the State Street and Elm Street areas. $47,340 for traffic calming and mitigation in the Leeds neighborhood north of Florence Street. $8,100 for traffic calming and mitigation off of Bridge Road in Florence. $2,000 for traffic calming and mitigation in the High Street Straw Avenue area. $26,000 for land acquisition, design, and improvement for a multi-use trail to connect to the bridge. And $2,000 for traffic calming and mitigation in the Spring Street area. Is there a motion to recommend in City Council, in Finance Committee? Motion to recommend. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Fyden. Um, so I'd like to, because this is complicated, I'd like to, to give you a brief PowerPoint walking you through and also address some of the, 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 some of the things I heard in the last discussion about public process and then if you, you want to do the same sort of amendment, which these projects are future projects and which projects are underway. Um, Mary, do you mind going two slides forward? 
I think I have to bring the remotes and I have to ask you to advance each one. So let me just talk briefly about what the source of money is. Um, most, but probably not all of you, were in city council when this was created. So I just want to give you a, a quick background. There is a section in Northampton zoning under the site plan approval section, which talks about traffic mitigation. Um, and, to those, and funds come in under that section. So that's what we're talking about. Um, and there's a clear formula. So the rule of thumb, first of all, is any project in the city which does not require a site plan from the planning board, which is most of them, has nothing to do with this. So if you're doing a single family home and you don't need site plan approval, we're not talking about your project. Projects above a certain threshold come before the planning board. Sometimes they're single family homes because they want two driveways, but usually much bigger pro projects. Um, every project that requires site plan approval is required for on site mitigation. So then we're not talking about cash here. If you're doing a project, we want your driveway where it hits the street to be safe. And so we care about curb cuts and sometimes a signal right there, whatever it is, that's required for every project. In some districts, and some projects, so not all, we also care about off-site traffic mitigation. Um, and so we have some specific exemptions. For example, city council and the mayor, planning board all said, we really need to encourage development in our industrial parks. That's something that the market, we, we've been losing our share of industrial jobs. So we do not require traffic mitigation for projects in the industrial park. Um, but you know, projects in King Street, we do. So again, some things require traffic mitigation, some do, don't. Under zoning, and this is required under state law, we don't have the right, at least we don't think we have the right, to charge a flat fee and have people pay it. We do have the right to have project developers make bricks and mortar improvements to address their project. So when Village Hill State Hospital Redevelopment went forward, they put a signal in at Village Hill and they made improvements on Earl Street which they did with money the city got for grants, but they were responsible for that. When Hill and Dale Mall went up, they're putting the redevelopment, they're putting a new signal with pedestrian phase at that signal and at Barrett Street. So most projects are doing these bricks and mortar. <coughs> Some projects, for various reasons, don't want to do those improvements. It may be the improvements take 10 years to come and they don't want to be on the hook for 10 years. It may be that they're doing a tiny project and they're responsible for 2% of a big project. So those projects can voluntarily pay a donation to the city in lieu of doing the bricks and mortar. It's their choice. Um, and our, our usual preference, and I'd say well over half the projects, are making bricks and mortar improvements. It's only the projects who say it doesn't work for me. So Walgreens, for example, had to contribute about $140,000 for traffic mitigation. Um, they gave us a bike path through their property. They gave us an easement for the bike path. And they agreed to maintain that bike path forever. And they got credit for that. And then they contributed a remaining $99,000 for the rest of their impact. Um, so you know, so they, we have different rates. So some people are all bricks and mortar. Some people are all cash. Some people are a hybrid of the two. So what we're talking about now is just how do we deal with the cash. So same, sort, same issues as before. We have a new city solicitor. The city and the old city solicitor, we'd been advised that we could spend these funds for improvements. Um, now we need to come before you, and that's, that's fine. Um, there are two basic rules that we need to follow for each one of these. One is we need to show what's called either, either rational nexus or reasonably related. We need to show that those funds will have a benefit for, to deal directly with the cars that we're, who's paying the fees. So when Walgreens gives us $99,000, we can't spend the money on, on Pleasant Street. Yeah, some cars drive down Pleasant Street or going to Walgreens, but we need to show this, this, this connection. This, there's two legal standards out there. Rational Nexus says we have to prove it. It has to exactly do with Walgreens. Reasonably related, which is probably the standard Massachusetts says, we have to show it's mostly related to Walgreens. Um, and so we need to show that connection. The other thing is the planning board, of course, is approving these projects. And the planning board is often putting conditions on how those funds can be spent. And we have to follow those, those conditions. Um, because you know, if they have a public meeting, for example, in Leeds for Beaverbrook subdivision, 
and the neighborhood says the problem is a lot of traffic on our streets and we really worry the safety of pedestrians. The planning board then said fine, we're getting traffic mitigation from this and most of the money has to be spent to deal with the, the impacts for pedestrians in that area. Whereas in some other area the issue might be cars not being able to make it through an intersection. So planning board can put conditions down to reflect the testimony that, that they heard. So that's sort of the background. Let me walk you through each project. Um, so you know, that this goes back to the public <laughs> process. So every single project we're talking about has one of three types of public process and often more than one. One is many of these have already been to traffic, uh, Transportation Parking Commission and have been approved. Um, second is many of these, the ones that aren't yet committed to projects, would have to go to traffic, Transportation and Parking. So the way most of these spend, funds get spent is when the mayor was chairman of the Transportation and Parking Commission, they set up a point system for a traffic calming system. And most of these funds get spent to support the traffic calming system. So they go through this whole process, it goes to Transportation and Parking, um, it goes to DPW, these things get rated and they get discussed before Transportation and Parking. So the majority of these go before them. There's some projects that are specifically specified by the planning board because of the comments that they heard in the public in public testimony. So those obviously go before a planning board process. Um, but everything goes to one or the other, or in some cases, both of those committees. So I'll, I'll go through these projects, but I just want to give you as a background. Yeah? Okay. Councilor. Um, just one clarification. As I recall in transportation and parking, um, it was generally a report that was accepted more than an approval process uh, at transportation and parking. And in fact, the approval process was one that came through the planning board by, by their site plan approval. Is that true? So there's been some of both. So for example, the Montview Avenue neighborhood, there's a specific vote that said um, their DPW was working with the neighborhood and planning department, and those projects then were approved. So there's been some of both. There's, there's always at least an annual presentation of these projects mm -hmm. where we go through, you know, basically the spreadsheet you have now, we go through and say, here are all these projects. And then for the point system, um, DPW would rate them and they go through. So, so a mixture of both. I think the two that have been specifically approved by Transportation Parking were the process for spending the money in the Montview area and the South Street bike lanes. So those two projects were specifically approved. The other ones were discussed more, as you were saying. But they were approved in addition to an approval process that happened at the planning board. That's correct. So I, I'll go through each project, but any general questions before I do that? Councillor Labarge and Councillor Tacey. When on this zoning, is this almost similar to way back? I can recall when I first started, and it was Ava Circle. And knowing that they have to give a letter of credit, correct? Any development that's occurring, no matter if it involves the zoning or what, a letter of credit, which is money, that has to go in through your department from a contractor or whatever. And I know because um, complete surveying wasn't done, there was quite a bit that was not completed, and I had meetings with the residents, and I came to the planning board requesting and gave reasons why that that letter of credit be given to the planning department until that builder went and did what was supposed to have been done by law. So is this kind of like the same thing? It has some similarities. This is something different. So whenever a subdivision and sometimes other projects are built, particularly on a project which is going to be sold to end users, to homeowners, we want to make sure that those end users don't get shafted. Um, so the developer posts a letter of credit is one way to do it, cash escrow, there's other mechanisms. They post cash in some form or other to guarantee the project gets done. Almost always, 99% of the time, the money goes right back to developers and we don't spend any. We spend it only when a developer defaults, either because of bankruptcy or, in essence, a failure because they refuse to do work. So um, Ava Circle is an example. The Ridge was a project which the bank took over. And the Ridge, we said we, we voted to call the money, and the bank said they were finished the project, so we didn't have to take that over. So again, but the part that's very similar is like traffic mitigation, we actually don't want cash. So the Ridge was a perfect solution. The planning board authorized the calling of the letter of credit. 
And then the bank was absolutely wonderful. They've been a pleasure to deal with. The bank is doing the work. That means we don't have to do any work for doing it. So it's similar in that respect, but serves a different purpose. Okay. So those are more about developer failures. This is about most projects, developers doing a great job, but they still have some responsibility <coughs> to mitigate offsite. Thank you. Councilor Tacey. Yeah. You said we, we don't have the right to charge a flat fee or we don't think we have the right to charge a flat fee. Do we know, have we, so have in, we researched it? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've researched, I can tell you what the issue is. In some states, there is specific authority for what's called impact fees. And there's actually been a bill pending in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, specific called authority the for what? Fees. Impact fee, okay. Yeah. Yep. And there had been bills pending in Massachusetts on and off for 15 years to specifically authorize that. And oddly enough, actually many developers support that because they want to have a clear formula. They don't, you know, so Massachusetts doesn't have that. There was a court case that went to Superior Court in Barnstable about affordable housing. And there was a court case that went to, I think it was Mass Appeals, but it might have been Land Court in Franklin. Um, both of which said, as applied in Barnstable and Franklin, the impact fees they were charging were not legal. That scared everybody, and there's never been a court case where a municipality has won. The courts were very, you know, so courts can do a challenge and basically say, Impact fees are automatically no good. That's not what happened here. They just said, as applied in Franklin and Barnstable, not, not done. But we just, because we don't have case law, it makes people nervous. And frankly, I don't think we want to be the test case. We know that payment in lieu of is perfectly legal. We've had it on our books for 40 years, because we used to do payment in lieu of parking downtown. So we know that's legal. And the answer is, until the legislature either specifically authorizes it or until some other community wants to be a test case, we just don't know. There's a strong argument that's perfectly legal. Um, so the imposition of, of, of a tax, is that legal? As opposed to so, payment in lieu of? No. So fee, the, the theory is police power, zoning type things. We have authority. We're what's called a home rule state. Any authority, any regulatory thing which the state legislature ha doesn't prohibit us from doing, we can do. And so regulations, unless the legislature says we can't do, we have the right to do. But for taxes, we only have the authority to do things which the state legislature specifically gives us authority for. So if it's a fee, we can do it. It's part of our police power authority. It's part of our right for selling services. So we can charge water fees. We can charge sewer fees. We can charge payment lieu of fees. But as soon as a tax, you have to have a specific piece of legislation that authorizes it. So when the gift. Uh, there is language in the law that says it has to be used right. for specifically Walgreens. It has to be used ex spe specifically for stuff that would impact traffic by the construction of the Walgreens facility. So there, there have been dozens of this generic term, I know it sounds negative for government, but the generic term for all these things we're talking about is exactions. When are we asking developers? to provide something. And so there's been a series of cases around the country and in Massachusetts saying you can do it depending on your state if you have this rational nexus that's directly related, you know, totally directly related or um, reasonably related. And so that's the part. That not, there's not a legislation about the fees per se, but it's lots of case law saying you need to show that what you're asking a developer to do is responsibility for their part. So let me just give you an example of a court case. Um, when Honda, the old Honda site, was approved by the Planning Board for redevelopment, the Planning Board looked at how much new traffic would, this, would the redevelopment generate. And they required the developer to make improvements to that intersection to address the new traffic. But we don't have the responsibility to make a developer fix existing deficiencies. So the fact that maybe King Street should have a dividing lane down the middle, maybe it should have other things, that's not something we can charge a developer for. That's a public responsibility. What we can charge a developer for is their impact on the world. So they add new cars. So we use traffic mitigation to address their new cars, you know, to make roads safer and, and to look at intersections like North and King. We use their money to make it safer for pedestrians because now that you have more traffic, maybe we need wider sidewalks to protect the pedestrians from cars. And we use their money for things like bike paths because if they're adding 100 cars a day and we can take 100 cars off a day in a bike path, then we're balancing it. So those things are legitimate because they're directly related. But we have to have it. We need to always show that connection. 
So, so Walgreens <coughs> put up $140,000 for traffic mitigation. They built or or provided funding to build uh, access to the bike path, costing some $50,000 or $42,000, and $99,000 goes to King Street. Now, did that happen the same with the church on King Street with the access to the bike path? Is that so the church is, is funding, so again, because our preference is bricks and mortar improvements, the church is p funding access from the bike path. So we won't get cash from them. They make the improvement that serves their needs so that people can go to the church. For yeah. I'm just, just getting at it, it, whether or not it, it's a lot of money. It could it be it used uh, $300,000 right here alone. Ryan it could be used to... somewhere else for mitigation. That, that's, that's my question. Is there, is there a creative way to utilizing it in, in some other form rather than uh, maybe painting some lines or something like that in an obscure place that uh, might not necessarily be a priority? Uh, no, I don't think there is. The way we've, and I'll go through these each, the way we've defined these areas, and this is in essence the authority we're, we're requesting, some for specific projects, some generic, is defining what are the areas which we think are legitimate to use. So, and, and, we, and we have to use that money within a certain a specified period of time, or it goes back to the developer. That's how yes, I understand it. Is I can't that tell you what the time period is. We, we, we can't just be sitting on this cash forever. We have to be showing good faith. I'm not aware of court cases where somebody actually challenged a town and said it took you five years and that's too long. Um, but yes, in theory, absolutely. If the money is there in 50 years, it's theirs. What's the time period? I don't know. One of the problems, the reason people give us cash is if the problem was we need 40 feet of sidewalk, We'd probably make the developer build a 40 feet of sidewalk. The problem is often we have to lump projects together. So uh, you see this in the list, but the Walgreens money is being lumped together with the corn shop money. And it's being used for some projects, some of which have a five year lead time. You know, we've been, who's ever been the council the longest may remember discussions about the bike path tunnel underneath the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things we're it. using the money for. That project has been in discussion for 15 years. Um, so, so courts understand that some of these projects just take a long, long time. Wayne. All right. Thank you. Okay. Say like the Allerton Bean Farm. And you know we had a traffic analysis done. We had everything done. We've been sitting back waiting for money to improve the intersection of Ryan Road and Florence Road. So we are looking at our recreational fields, hopefully. That Construction will start on them and so forth and that's traffic and I do know that one of our residents in Ward 7 on Ryan Road had great concerns of her child okay and having and you did talk with her and I about it when we came into your office in regards to a trail that would connect from Ryan Road over to where the recreational fields are so why is that not being considered? So, so that's a perfect example of, of how these monies come in. So that, that, let, me, let me use that as a scenario. So one of the biggest pieces there is the 24-acre recreation area. Under our ordinance, the city does not have to pay traffic mitigation fees. The theory is the city is responsible for everything. Paying something to ourselves doesn't make sense. So the city is exempt. In spite of that, because that project will clearly generate a lot of traffic, what the Recreation Commission volunteered to do and what the Planning Board required them to do was they built sidewalks the entire length of the project. That's the first thing they did. And those sidewalks are extra wide, so they're bicycle friendly. Mm -hmm. And next spring, they'll be building sidewalks from their project all the way up to Corticelli Street with a new crosswalk. So we're, we're directly mitigating those impacts, but they're not required to do anything. Likewise, the biggest thing in terms of acreage, Grow Food Northampton bought 120 acres, more or less. Um, under Massachusetts law, this isn't a local law, they're exempt from site plan approval and special permits. So they do no traffic mitigation. There are two single family homes that were built on Spring Street and they gave $1,000 each. So the Bean Allard property generated $2,000 in traffic mitigation. And that's in the list we're going to go through tonight. So, but that's an example, you know, you, you sort of, some things are exempt and some things aren't. Thank you. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Hi, uh, thank you. I have a question because as you saw on Tuesday, I'm very uh, confused and possibly angry about this order. Um, you said that there are three, but really actually probably two public processes for this, uh, for these kinds of expenditures. One, 
is uh, Transportation Parking Commission either has gone or will go. And then the second is Planning Board. So, but you said that it was planning, you said a planning board, but that's unclear to me. Do you mean that the public process is on the front end during approval of these sorts of for some problem. Because you, you, no one from OPD goes back to planning board, discusses the project, that the finished uh, proposed plan, and then asks for planning board approval. That's correct. So, 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 that, so doesn't, that doesn't happen, correct? That's correct. Okay, so, so after planning board approves the project and gives its specifications, the, the current pro practice is Office of Planning and Development goes about executing its its um, plan for traffic calming and mitigation, tra traffic mitigation, and does not go back to planning board. So then the other piece, the piece that happens on the back end, the expenditure side, is Transportation Parking Commission. But what I don't see here anywhere is any requirement that any of these expenditures go before the Transportation Parking Commission. And what I also read is that if the council votes to approve this laundry list today, I'm just making a statement now, you can, you can contradict me, if the council rules to make these, approve this laundry list today, no one will have to go before Transportation and Parking Commission. By the letter of the law, the Office of Planning and Development will be authorized to expend these funds and not have to ask Transportation and Parking for any approval. Am, am I wrong? Well, two, two things. One is, the planning board process, I mean, our experience is the time you get the most number of people out of the public hearing is frankly not Transportation and Parking Commission. It's when all the neighbors have been notified and there's some big evil project they don't like. So to me, the planning board process is pretty significant because that's when your people say, yeah, we think you should be providing this tra kind of traffic mitigation, not that kind of traffic mitigation. So I, I, I think that's an important process. Yes, it's early on, but to the extent we can discuss those things, that would be fine. The second thing is, I mean, city councils created committees, and they have clear charges. And so we go to the committees for whatever the committee's charge is. So transportation and parking is charged with, with parking policy. So when we're doing something that has to do with parking policy, it goes before Transportation and Parking Commission. When we're doing something that has to do with bicycle and ped activities, it goes before the Bike and Ped Committee. Um, so each of these things goes before that. And, and as you know, every contract has to be signed by the mayor and every approval over $1,000. So we're a feeder service of fire to make sure we do that process there. Councilor, put it in the order. I'll vote for it. But it's not in the order. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm very apprehensive. In fact, I'm against it. But I do understand that there are some projects that have gone before transportation parking and projects that are in the works. Maybe you want to take us through Yeah, that. so let me do that because the vast majority of funds we're talking about have gone through that process. And there are a few areas that are between 39,000 in one spot and 2,000 somewhere else which haven't yet gone through that process. And, you know, if you guys want to put that off to go through transportation parking, that doesn't create big problems for me. It's, so let me go through all these projects and you know where we are and I'll, and I'll try to highlight which ones it is important from our standpoint because we think we've gone through the process. So, okay, next slide. So I'm just going through one at a time. It's the same order the mayor read these so you know where these are. So Bridge Street to Hockman Road, this was traffic mitigation for I think it was two different projects, one on Hockman Road and one off Hockman Road. Um, some of these funds have been spent. This is the one that did go to Transportation and Parking Commission, and they specifically voted to authorize the funds, and the process was it could only be things done in dialogue with the neighborhood, approved by DPW and the Planning Board. So we already received a vote from Transportation and Parking Commission for this. Um, the fund was bigger. I forgot the exact dollar amount. DPW has spent some of the funds. This is the, this is the balance when the solicitor said we need to come before you. There's, I think, a few hundred dollars more in this that's already committed or projects have been spent, and the rest are projects which will be identified hopefully over the winter and, and for next year. So we believe we've already gone through a public process in Transportation and Parking Commission. I'm going to go through one at a time the discussion, or I'm going to go through them all and come back? No, go, go through them and people can ask questions right. as they arise. So second one is Park and Ride Lots. This one's a little bit different than many of them. This was, we do have a section it's called Transportation Demand Management in Arizona Ordinance where we encourage developers of projects above 25,000 feet to think about how they can reduce traffic and parking. So Smith College came before the city with Ford Hall. Under normal zoning, they would have been required to build a second parking garage. 
they came to the planning board and asked for a special permit to reduce the number of parking spots. And they said, here's all the measures we're going to do to um, reduce the amount of cars from, you know. So our zoning standard is sort of if Fort Hall was in the middle of suburbia, how many trips would it generate? They come before and say, well, it's not the middle of suburbia. Here's the things we're doing. We're going to, and, and, and I don't want to sound like we're twisting Smith's arm. Smith had a lot of things they wanted to do anyway because they wanted to do the right thing. And this was a way to give, to encourage them to do it. So Smith implemented a zip car program, as you all know, and that was, even though they did it voluntarily, they couldn't drop the Smith car without providing parking. So they have to provide four zip cars under the, or, under the zoning. I believe they have five. Um, they have to do an employee cash out program. So Smith used to charge, and I forgot the exact dollar amount, but it was the neighborhood of $10 or $20 a parking spot. And the parking spots were transferable. Um, so it didn't really discourage you from driving to campus. So Smith increased the fees they charge for parking, and if you agreed not to drive to campus, they would give you cash to cash out. So they did that. And then the third and final one is they agreed to give us $5,000 a year to support the existing park and ride lot at Sheldon Field and the planned park and ride lot at um, the VA Medical Center. Um, and they can always come back and revisit it and say there's other ways they're more mechanism, they're, they're more effective. But until they do that, they give us $10,000 a year with, I think it's a 4% inflation rate. So they've given us $10,500 so far. They owe us about $5,500 for, for this year. So that's $15,000. Um, and so we're, we are asking for this one for blanket approval to let us spend the funds for these two park and ride lots for maintenance improvements. The first project we plan to do, which we've already gone through the Conservation Commission. So this was a, 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 a big process before uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels was city councilor. We had a meeting with the neighborhood with the last city councilor. They were very concerned about people walking along Old Ferry Road. They asked us to explore doing a sidewalk from the park and ride lot to the basketball court, which is an over, overflow site. We have done a preliminary design for that as a sidewalk through there. We've gone before the Conservation Commission and received their approval. We went before the Recreation Commission, received their approval. And so that's the immediate project we would like to go to bid this winter. So we just want to like your approval today for this. But uh, you know, there will be $5,000 a year to support these projects. Through the chair? Councilor. Um, uh, I do understand Councillor Freeman Daniels' question surrounding the, around this, uh, given that um, we do have uh, an ordinance before us to refer um, uh, traffic mitigation processes to the Transportation and Parking Commission in addition to Planning Board and the Mayor and City Council. So um, I fully respect and understand where this is coming from. However, I do think that this has been the long past practice up until now. Many of these have been discussed, as you pointed out, for a number of years. Um, I'm happy to entertain uh, adding that level. I think we actually, at ordinance, asked that, it, that this particular ordinance be referred back to Planning Board for their input as well, in terms of a change in how the um, uh, traffic mitigation expenditures will ultimately be decided. Um, but I, so my sense is because we're in the process of this as, as an ordinance change and ultimately as part of the changing of the charge of many of our subcommittees, I would be inclined to support all these when it moves to the full committee um, because just for that reason that we've been working on them for many years and then entertain a, a possible change in terms of the process going from this point forward. If I could add, you know, I, I have no objection to the, the ordinance that's been introduced whatsoever. I mean, to look at the language, but in concept, no objection whatsoever. But zoning by its very nature is proactive. So even if that zoning passed tonight, it wouldn't affect all those projects that have been approved already. It would be new projects. You can't do that stuff retroactively. I mean, obviously, you could it tonight as finance and, and council, but not through the zoning piece. Mary, next slide. So next one is Grove Street. Again, this is one we'd like to move forward on. Um, some of you may know we have a bike path that, that hits Grove, the intersection um, with Earl Street. It's a very steep hill that's steeper than 5% going up Grove. 5% is sort of the magic number for ADA standards, but it's also harder to bicycle up. 
So we've been looking at two options for doing a bike path at the top of the hill through a housing authority property or through a piece of city owned property that would let it be connect. 5,000 obviously doesn't let us build it. This is really about design, doing the feasibility. So we'd like to, we'd like to hire someone that's full, again, assuming you all do this time. Um, next slide. So South Street, this, the contracts have been signed. They're going to go forward, assuming you vote tonight. So this is a $91,000 project to modernize the South Street bicycle lane. The 46456 would clean out the traffic mitigation money that we have for roads on South Street, and the remainder would come from a, a grant that, that funded uh, traffic or funded mitigation for state hospital development. So that would, and, and that, because it's a grant, doesn't come, need to come before you. Um, again, most of this money came from the gas station at 54 East Hampton Road. A little bit of it came from the publishing company. It may have been a minuscule amount from some other project. But the vast majority of this is from the, the gas station. Um, this did come before Transportation and Parking Commission. They held a, a hearing, I think a subcommittee. Remember the subcommittee, the whole committee held a, sub, a, a public hearing at the South Street Music Center, mm -hmm. and so that one's gone in detail. Counselor. What did you say that, just back up one, uh, for the rail trail access on Grove Street, where'd that money come from? The rail trail access, that actually came from the Housing Authority property in the corner of Laurel and Grove. That's where the money came from. That's where the money came from. So it's fitting to connect, because that's what we're talking about, is something yep. from the Housing Authority property to the bike path. Okay, and the DPW, are, did they look into this at all? I mean, just curious. They would as we go forward, we're really just concept level and trying to figure out where the options are for them. Okay, thank you. Is that the McColgan Apartments? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I know you haven't hit it yet. I, well, I guess I'll let you talk to the 183183, which is your next item, right? Okay. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So Manhattan Rail Trail, this is also from the 54 East Hampton Road gas station. So with this one came before the planning board. Planning board said the gas station will generate more traffic, so we want to make South Street safer. So that's why they put $50,000 or so into South Street. And we also want to get cars off the road. How do we make the Manhattan Rail Trail you know, provide more connections? So we've spent some money on, on that so far. And this is looking at things like a Hebert Avenue on-ramp, which we did have a meeting. The ward councilor sponsored a meeting with the neighborhood to get people's input about using her Hebert Avenue getting access. We've been working with um, pathways in Rocky Hill and Ice Pond about connecting that trail. So it's really basically how do we, because the goal eventually is for the Manhattan Rail Trail to have access points to all neighborhoods and eventually have a spur that goes all the way out to as close to Ryan Road School as we can. Is this more than one access? Well, this is as far as $37,000 takes us. I mean, you, you had a litany of different right. locations and it just says access. Mm -hmm. The issue access. is we do design first and we tend to do design all together. Um, and then we look for what are the easy spots to do it. This, this, this is access, this is plural. This is access, pl as plural access points we're looking at. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Just so for the record, I, I just, I would, I would want to delete this one um, because the council would be granting approval before it's reviewed by pedestrian and bicycle and ped committee and before it's reviewed by transportation parking. This is an example of one that I don't think is specific enough. Hey, can I just be clear? So this has gone before bike and ped. They've already approved, they set a priority list. We asked them, we looked at three projects. We asked them which is most important. They said Florence Road um, up to Emerson Way, Hebert Avenue second, um, and then the next piece crossing um, uh, Birds Pit third. So we already have a priority list for them. This is really more about once we start moving these projects, then we get designs and we need people to work with design, DPW or bike pad. So that's sort of the process. For them. But it's not specific. It's, I'd like to see more specificity. But I guess I'm, here's the challenges we have. I don't know we can do more specificity until we start doing feasibility studies. So we know the routes, we know the areas we're looking at, we don't know exactly what's what. So I'm not sure what are the other things we can do un until we get to that point. But that's often the challenge. You know, we all said, you all know it took us 12 or 13 years to do all the rail trails we just opened. And that was always the problem with them is the first dollar in was the challenge. You know, we got $13 million from the state and federal government to actually build them. It was these first pieces, this $37,000 of trying to figure out what are the opportunities and the challenges. Okay, so $37,000, grand scheme of things, not a lot of money. But I'd, I'd like to see 
like you like when it comes to any, almost any expenditure, I like to see the map that shows the, the potential uh, spots that uh, that the bike ped committee has uh, has prioritized, the plans that you'd like to look at. Um, this is just one entry on a laundry list. It's just not enough. I, I I'm I'm comfortable with the South Street one. I'm not comfortable with past practices, and uh, I'm I'm comfortable I'm comfortable with the uh, Sheldon Field. Those are those are. Uh, development and maintenance and uh, for instance the Grove Street one that seems very specific uh, I'm actually I disagree with you about the Bridge Street and Hockenham Road one I, I don't think that there's a, there's actually been enough um, going on there but uh, I think actually probably some of that money's already been spent so I think we, we might as well approve it uh, so this I, I'm just gonna say this is another example of one that I'd like to see specific order outlining what you wanted what the Office of Planning and Development wants to uh, do a feasibility study on, and that comes in separately from one slide on a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Councilor Kern. Um, uh, maybe uh, I'll just, I know you're going to go through the 183 and the 91 for the next two, the specifics of those, but I just want to speak as former um, chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission and maybe also defer to the previous former chair in terms of the uh, number of um, updates and, and changes that have gone on for the following two, uh, especially regarding additions to monies as they come in for site plan approval. So for example, we had Walgreens and then we had um, Amazon.net mm -hmm. and we had a number of things that as they, as they continued to get site plan approval, built up that particular pot of money to to finally address some serious problems such as that intersection at uh, uh, North Street, Summer and King, and then further up as we know their serious intersection at Hatfield and um, North King. So uh, it, it's been my recollection that, it, you know, not on a monthly basis but, basis, but certainly on a quarterly basis, we reviewed uh, again, some laundry list, but more of an Excel spreadsheet of where the money, not only the monies themselves, but which projects they came from and uh, what state we were at, at least in planning, in terms of embarking on feasibility and, and plans to mitigate the traffic. So, you know, I understand the counselor's uh, concern and wanting to take each one out at this point, but I, I would just hate after all of these years of working on these to um, have to slow them down too much further. Um, but uh, I can understand going forward why the Transportation and Parking Commission may want to take on that expanded role and look in very close detail at each and every project and each and every line as it comes through, if it wishes. And if the planning board wishes to defer that further to transportation and parking. Councilor Schwartz. I think to me the question is at what point uh, is process gets in the way of serving our constituents. And I would suggest that the process that I've heard about thus far uh, is a process that serves our constituents and that while I'm totally open to continue continually tweaking, revising, ensuring maximum oversight and input. I am not a supporter of of halting a process that has been participatory and inclusive and gone through the channels that have been set up that have has arrived at a point of execution and for our body to get in the way of ultimately serving our residents of Northampton. It just there's something in this discussion that feels off to me. Councillor Freeman Daniel. I just want to respond to that because I, I, um, I agree that sometimes process can uh, uh, can uh, get in the way of um, a good idea uh, because the good idea can get could get watered down or or um, or, uh, or halted, uh, and there might be you might have some time frame that you miss. Uh, I don't think this is the case at all. Um, number one, uh, there's a distinction between. Uh, asking for permission and giving an update. When you give an update, that's transparency. You're telling someone what you're doing, but you're not actually asking them to actually approve what you're doing. 
the second piece is asking permission. And a good idea should never fail because you have to ask permission. And the second piece is I, I have I have knowledge, firsthand knowledge of the failure of serving our of serving my constituents uh, with uh, Bridge Street and Hockenham Road. Um, the traffic mitigation funds it took them it took my uh, my fellows on the Ward Three Neighborhood Association years years to actually ne negotiate the process, which was not open. It was transparent. They saw who was making the decisions, but they couldn't influence them. They didn't know that actually they could appeal to their to their counselors because it was the counselors who actually gave approval for these kinds of these kinds of pro these kinds of expenditures. It, in fact, it, it just wasn't the practice of the city to to um, bring these expenditures before the council, even though it was state law. Now we understand it's state <coughs> law. So I think that we would be shirking our responsibilities by not requiring these expenditures to come before us with the kind of public process that they that I really think they need. And, and I'll just I, it took five years, five years to come to a reasonable solution of speed humps on Holly Street and William Street and many other proposals that my constituents wanted were shot down. <coughs> uh, and they might have had a chance of, of actually passing if they were brought before this body, but they but they weren't. So I disagree that uh, this process is getting is is actually a barrier. I think it's enabling number one and number two, like I said before, I wasn't comfortable with past practice and uh, that's just an example. And, and I do believe that any expenditure that we that it's the council's job to review, we should see some specificity on. And if we want to delegate it to a certain committee or commission, for instance, the bike ped or transportation parking commission, that's our right. But to give up this right again, like I said, on some of these, we have good process. They're in the works. I'm in favor of them. On some of the other ones, I just don't think that spending $37,000 after being assured that uh, a committee has reviewed it uh, and that we've seen the updates, I just don't think that's enough. So that's, uh, that's my response. Uh, uh, Mr. Fyden wanted to make a comment, but uh, Councilor Tacey, did you have I just, I just wanted to say that I, I don't believe that uh, this is this 37375. I don't think if we don't approve that uh, right at this point, I don't think that's an impediment. I don't see, uh, I know there's been some work done on this, but I don't, I don't see a huge amount of work. I don't see this as slowing down any process. I think maybe the, uh, the process could be a little more in depth, I think, on that, and on a couple of them. Um, but I really, and, and, I, and I do think, uh, that by questioning these and bring, bringing these forward and maybe starting a little more public process, and we, we are serving our constituents much better. Um, and I know that uh, sometimes we've been told certain things that this can be used for this or that can be used for that, and, and sometimes it turns out not to be the case. So um, I, I I do think there needs to be more process in some of these. Um, and. Anyway, we'll see uh, at the end. We can separate some of these out. Uh, I just want to make a comment, uh, again, my role as finance committee member, um, and that is that, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm actually, I'm excited that we're arguing about traffic calming projects, because there was a time in the city where we couldn't even, like, get it off the page into, like, actually creating projects. So it's great that we're actually seeing, there's actually money now coming in that we're we'll able to use. And, you know, the, the the speed humps that you're describing your award are technically the first speed humps funded by our traffic calming program in the city. So it's not like we've been funding, you know, hundreds of speed humps under a past illegal practice. These are the first ones we've ever funded. Grove Street was done through a direct, the developer built them, and the ones in Jackson Street were built by a grant from, you know, from stimulus money. So these are really the first ones. I just want to, you know, keep it in context. We, you know, this isn't, we haven't been doing this for 20 years wrong. This is a new thing that we're sort of feeling our way through. Um, and I'm excited because, again, we were doing all these traffic calming um, reviews, but we never had any dollars to actually put in, put, to put in play, uh, like we now have with South Street, like we have in your ward. Like, so I just want to keep it in that context. Uh, but I definitely appreciate the concern about making sure that we have all the proper approvals and doing all those things. I just want to be clear that we haven't been expending money 
to build speed humps around the city with mitigation funds. The first ones we've done are in your war. So anyway, that's just my historic context. Are, are we defining all of these as traffic calming? Is that the definition or is it, that's what I didn't think? Mitigation. Traffic mitigation. Okay, I, want, I just wanted to make that distinction. Traffic mitigation, okay. Councilor, uh, Councilor Dwight and then I, yeah. Yeah, well actually this is to Wayne anyway, don't allow Wayne to expand on this. The, uh, um, I, I want to parse out and identify the thrust of both the concerns, your concerns and Councilor Freeman Daniels and see if there is a way that it can be reconciled in such a way that, that would meet the approval of the council. And so what are, what are your concerns as you want, as uh, relative to what he's being, what he is suggesting, the, the, the level of oversight that he's recommending? Well, I, I guess there's two comments about that. The first is practical, because most, if not almost all these projects that have real things attached have gone through some sort of public process already. So the three on here, for example, the rail trails, were included in the city's open space recreation rail trail plan which was approved by seven boards, including this, which we had at least 14 public meetings, three of which were public hearings. Um, I gave up a lot of last year's evenings for those meetings, and, and I guess I do take exception to say we didn't have a public process, because we did a lot. This, the second thing is, and I have no objections whatsoever, because I'm on transportation and parking, but the role of transportation and parking is morphing. And it started, I think, as a policy committee and now it's getting much more involved mm -hmm. with specific projects, which I'm absolutely fine with. True. I think you as a body and some patient parking need to think about what's the role of the So, you know, for example, the transportation plan gives this example. Transportation plan says the assumption is new intersections that have to be controlled should be controlled with a roundabout. And if they're not going to be a roundabout, then it should go before transportation and parking and Board of Public Works. So the idea was we have a policy that says roundabouts Therefore, roundabouts don't need to come before the committee unless we're cheating on the policy. I, I'm fine changing that role, but I want to understand that, that better. Um, the, the third, and this is unique to three of these projects, the rail trail projects. Remember, road projects are in the city right of way. So I understand this is in some ways your only crack at the apple. But rail trail projects, every single one doesn't go forward until we acquire right of way. And none of the ones we're talking about have required right of way. So if city council doesn't like any of these projects, they won't go forward. But I can't, I can't, you know, you've talked about developing this more. I can't develop them more until I get people to do some basic questions. I need surveys, I need contours, I need engineering. The, the one off Laurel Street, for example, um, it's almost flat from the intersection of Laurel to the bike path, but in, in between there's a huge hill. So can we cut down the hill to put up a trail? I don't know the answer. And so I can't really go to the next step without answering something. Right, so you're, right now, you're, you're feeling sort of in, in, uh, in purgatory in some sense, and that you are incapable of rendering or present, your argument is you're ca incapable at this point of presenting the specificity that Council Freeman Daniels wants because you're also held, are you suggesting that you're being held back because you absent this authorization? Well, for, for this one and for the one on, on Grove Street, these are about feasibility studies to understand the challenge. Right. For the next one we're going to talk about, that's actually some bricks and mortar, actually, it's land acquisition. Right, and, that, and that specificity is built in that. But, it, but you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just really trying to, I, I'm trying to understand everyone's objections in the, in the process or in, and also everyone's uh, desires. And I think actually, I think all parties here are working essentially for the same public good. I don't think one, come, one is arguing one side versus the other. It's just that I think that is we're, we're going to have to we're going to have to render some sort of decision and maybe and, and I think I, I I may be misinterpreting in some level what Council Freeman Daniels is suggesting, but he so of course he wants to parse these. I, am I correct? You want to parse out the, the what's being presented with uh, in addressing some specificity to some per, uh, particular applications. I think it's germane. I think I think at least from what I understand, the point that he made uh, relative to permission and present versus presentation, uh, you know, he, he's right. That's that's a significant difference. Um, transparency is transparency, but um, um, deliberative, contributive process by elected representative members does 
there there is a critical point. I mean, that's beyond that we don't need a democracy. And so, and I I think that that is worthy of consideration. Obviously, I don't think that you're trying to end run it, but at the same time, I can also and I but I also can certainly understand why it might be cons considered as somewhat of a tedious impediment. Just to be clear, I, you know, Council Freedom Daniel's main point, I think, of which projects are ready for prime time and which aren't, I have no objection to. There's several of these projects which, and I'll go through these, some of them are later, which we haven't identified exactly what they're for. So we thought we'd come before you tonight to identify, back to Councilor Tacey's question, what were the eligible areas. But if, if the council wants to put those off, I, I have no objection to that. I, I think the area where I would probably disagree with the councilor is which projects are ready. This one, for example, I'm not sure I could do much between now and when we spend the money. So I, I think we're ready. If you understand, so I'm sort of which project are actually ready. The line, which those are what I'm trying to move forward. I'm sorry. I'm, no, that's okay. I understand. Councilor, I think we're. I think we are. We're, we're, I don't think we're disagreeing too much. I just think that, I, I mean, <laughs> we I, I've we approved a budget with some some with less specificity. But I, I think that it would be nice to see, to see the map, uh, to see the the potential drawings, to see the things you want to do a feasibility study on. Uh, I, I just don't think that slide is enough for me to want to vote uh, to approve it. So I, I, like. Like Councilor Schwartz said, I don't want to get in the way of exploring a good idea, but I also don't want to um, spend, uh, authorize the expenditure of what may be a good idea and then see all the money go out the door uh, and not know what's, what's happening to it. And, and I think you're right. I think I'm sort of relying because we did this in the open space plan. I'm sort of thinking we went through that process. But so let me finish going through the list. It's like the budget. I mean, we you approve the budget. That doesn't mean you love every line item. Right. So the, the next one I want to go through, because this is important, this is by far the biggest ticket item, almost half the money is right here. So, so this is a similar yeah. process where this one's a little complicated. So this is the Walgreens money is the biggest part of this. The amazing.net is a part of it. And there's some smaller ones that are, frankly, I'm escaping exactly which money came from without looking at my, my cheat sheet. But River Valley? No, River Valley is separate. That will come up oh. later. Don't, um, don't. So we have, a, we have a roughly $183,000 for Lower King Street, uh, Walgreens being the biggest portion of this. Um, and we've identified three projects. We have held a series of meetings about this. We had a lot of meetings about this, both as part of the open space plan, as a neighborhood meeting, which because Edward Square is right at the edge of three wards. We, had, we invited the three wards together, met with the neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, we had, we hired Fuss and O'Neill to begin the process of North and King Street. So we had process there. And then we hired Nelson Nygaard to do an overall charrette when they looked at the intersection. So we've done a lot of these processes. And we have a, a three-step process for priorities. The immediate top priority right now is purchasing the right-of-way from National Grid to go behind Wendy's for, for a bike rail trail tunnel. You're, when you get back to the full council, your first item is to postpone an item, it's a, a taking, it's coming for you. Okay. The reason we're doing this, when we talked to National Grid, we said, we move forward in Edwards Square and Bank of, of America, and they said, we really want you to do all the projects you have this year at once. So we put that on hold so we could also do this taking. We have an appraisal that's underway. We're then be coming back to council in probably November and asking to purchase those properties. So that's the first one is soft costs and right of way acquisition for a rail trail tunnel that goes. Do you have a question, Councillor? Yeah, for the benefit of those that are yeah. watching, Wendy's. You said in Taco Bell, Bell yeah. KFC. Thank you. I'm sorry. Just for those that are watching that don't, yeah, yeah. maybe don't remember Wendy's. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. You're right. Um, so that's such, and as you may know, the state is going to build the rail trail. The state is going to donate the right of way underneath the railroad tracks. The railroad tracks themselves will be state owned, but the land on the west side of the railroad tracks is owned by National Grid. And so we need to purchase that. So that's the first priority. The second one that is building is off ramp off Edwards Square, which we've been talking about for a while. We plan to build this year, but it got on hold because of this process. And then to go back to the design of North Street and King Street and advance that design. So we're ready to go on all three of them. We can't do the design of North King Street till we know the cost for the land. But so the goal is to do right of way this fall and, and winter, 
to do the uh, um, RFP or the bids for the Edward Square during the winter, and then the money that's left will be going towards the design. Councilor Labarge, did you have a question? Yes. Wayne, I've noticed that you're asking for two readings tonight. Is that your request? If you split them, I guess it wouldn't matter, but the ones that are critical are South Street, contracts been signed and they'd like to go ahead with the work and, and, and uh, leads as well. So th that's the time piece. The rest, two, two additional weeks. Okay, so within that two weeks on the ones that we look at, is there any way that you could bring in what Councillor Owen Freeman Daniels is asking for so that it can be placed up on the screen? And, that, and I have to agree with him on that. Times are changing, okay? I mean, yes, this is the policy that we've done for oh, quite a while. And I think by having that placed on the screen and letting the counselors and also the public see exactly what areas you're talking about. So I think, is there a possibility that you could have that done for us in the next city council meeting in two weeks? Yes. Um, I, so if you're willing, I guess the procedure would be to split the question, I guess the right term, to split the question so the ones that, that a contract is waiting at DPW could go forward um, and then the other ones could come back in two weeks, that would be just fine. So, Thank you. Wayne, why don't you specify the ones that you that absolutely need two readings, and then we can we can uh, move on with the other business of um, the council. So, um, it's seven thousand dollars okay? out of the ones that are in leads. It's the entire amount on South Street. And Susan, do you have any numbers? That it? Are you involved with those emails? Which one? It was a series of emails from DPI with which ones they needed immediately. Um, I believe it's the South Street one. That's the only one? South Street, and then seven thousand. Are there any others that we can do tonight? So seven thousand oh, from the reading. Yeah. And then I guess the 91,000 haven't gone to yet for the River Valley market. Why don't we so do that? We have time to work on that. Those three are the ones that we have immediate contracts we need to do. Which is the 7,000? So it's part of 47,340 in Leeds. So you're going to need that 46456.32. So you're asking for that to be approved. Asking for that, asking for 7,000 leads money, and then 91,000 out of the North Kings for the River Valley market money. So again, we're still in finance. Do you want to complete the do you want to complete the presentation or do we want to move this out of finance so that we can divide the question in the regular you can divide the yes. question in the regular meeting and then we can move on with the business of finance okay. knowing that you'll be coming back with further details to fill in the gaps of some of these other projects okay we move it so uh we can move it forward uh, there's been a motion to recommend we can stick with that or we can uh uh, no. I recommend it, and I recommend that we move this now to full city council. Okay, so all those in all of the orders, just those. well, just it, the two that we're talking. About. Well, we can we can we can divide it in the full city council. Exactly. Right. So I, I, I was so going to say moving this forward as we did before without a recommendation. Okay, fine. Yes, so, thank you. Is there a second to that? Second. Second. It. All those in favor and finance of moving it out to the full city council with no recommendation, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. So um, that completes that uh, item. We've got a public hearing, too. Uh, yes, we do, although we don't have anyone from National Grid here. Do we? We do. No. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So we'll We've be, been we'll here be a just, while. We'll be with you momentarily. That doesn't mean um, Wayne gets to go, does it? Uh, not quite yet. I didn't go um, okay. So we actually, um, there's actually okay. one other financial order that's on the main agenda, and I believe it should come to the finance committee because of our role as property committee, because it involves a transfer of property. So I do want to take this one up um, in, in finance before we adjourn finance committee. This is upon the recommendation of the Conservation Commission and Councillor Maureen Carney, ordered that whereas the open space recreation and multi-use plan 2011 through 2017 recommends expanding the Connecticut River Greenway to preserve the wildlife corridor along and to the Connecticut River 
And whereas the city owns 6.5 acres of land located behind 21 Hatfield Road and abutting and nearby to the northerly sections of the city-owned Connecticut River Greenway, said land consists of Assessor's Map 13051 and a sliver of property extending up to Hatfield Road, and whereas said land has a very low market value but has the potential to preserve a rich wetland and bird habitat, now therefore be it ordered that City Council authorizes the mayor to execute a deed transferring the care and custody of above reference land to the Conservation Commission and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided by Section 8C of Chapter 40 of the General Laws, the Community Preservation Act, and Article 97 of the Amendments to the Massachusetts Constitution, any fee, easement, or conservation restriction as defined in Section 31 of Chapter 184 of the General Laws or any other interest in the above land, and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions on any land so acquired. Is there a motion? So moved. Second it. Okay. Um, this is sort of a two-part story because uh, uh, I think it so. I can, Mr. Fine's been recognized, but I want to recognize the city treasurer as well because this is a, uh, there's a background to how it is that the city has this 6.5 acre parcel to begin. Need to recognize the treasurer. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 So we recognize city treasurer George Zimmerman. Um, and th just to provide some background on how the city came into possession of the 6.5 acre property that we're asking you to divide up and, and give uh, our part to the conservation commission. We have to work tomorrow. Stay here until tomorrow. Well, in a nutshell, the um, city became the reluctant owner uh, of this piece of property. Originally, it's uh, configured as three separate parcels. Uh, there's a home on the uh, no more, most northerly parcel. Uh, this is a uh, tax title uh, collection that goes back to fiscal year 2002. Uh, the previous treasurer, Helen Marusik, began working on it. Uh, according to what I see in the file, she was doing uh, everything that she could as diligently as possible to collect. In 2004, I continue, began to continue her work. Uh, th uh, through that course of time, uh, this property <coughs> uh, passed, uh, the title passed, uh, by a probate process, and the taxpayer um, basically uh, went out of sight. Uh, uh, telephone calls to reach the taxpayer, uh, letters, uh, <clears throat> contact by the land court uh, with notices for trial went unanswered. So through that process, a, um, uh, a, a judgment was issued, a default judgment was issued because the taxpayer never appeared, granting ownership of this parcel of land to the city. Okay. Counselor. Are you guys in possession of a better map than this? Um, it doesn't copy very well. I mean, not with us. Um, we have a survey, we send that, or we have a survey underway, and we have better air photos of it. Um, I mean, something that's a little legible. I mean, I can't, I can't even read it. Yeah, okay. We can send it to you, but no, not with me. So again, just, so this was a parcel that we just recently acquired um, through this tax uh, title process. Um, and so uh, the, um, because we have an interest in preserving this conservation land, as well as the rail trail development that that uh, we've been working on at that spur. That's why this order is being brought before you to subdivide this land. And the plan going forward is we will auction off the uh, the remaining parcel that has a home on it. We've secured the home. The home is in uh, serious disrepair. We've secured it. Um, Central Services has done that. And our plan is to au just put it at auction. So we've begun that process. But this will allow us to subdivide off this parcel that we have an interest in, uh, make all the proper filings with the registry, and then the remaining parcel with the house lot, um, uh, which would be about a five-acre parcel, I believe, uh, we would then auction um, and use the proceeds to satisfy the tax debt. And are, are these the three parcels? Yes. There's one, two rectangular and one triangular. I know. They're very difficult. And is this going to require two readings? 
I, I don't know what Mr. Fiden's... Uh, no, he's yes, two readings. I mean, we don't need two readings tonight. Not tonight. Not it's not on. Yeah. Can, can you present us with a, with a better yeah, absolutely. map, something yeah. we can look at? Okay. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Who is going to hold the uh, conservation restriction? Um, we have an agreement so far. We, you know, we still have to always look for other owners, but we have generally been working with Kestrel Land Trust um, whenever we acquire land. So my assumption will be Kestrel Land Trust. And how much will they uh, will they charge for these pieces? Um, the arrangement we've had so far is hundred dollars per acre. So that's likely to be the. So that's going to be how many how many acres is the six and a half acre? We, we have a survey now, but roughly. Going to go into conservation. That's correct. And that's six hundred, and that's one time. That's one time. Six hundred fifty dollars. Councilor Barge. So we're going to make three lots out of this parcel. No. So right now, there's so there's a history of this property. It's very messy if you look it up. This was a farm before the interstate was built. It had frontage on both um, Hatfield Road and North King Street. The interstate cut it off. So there were three parcels, which used to be very large. Now there's three smaller parcels. So the two northerly ones, the rectangle, the triangle, and yours, mm -hmm. will be merged together and sold roughly five, five and a half acres, six acres, whatever that is. And that will be sold. And then the six and a half acres and back, again, roughly, will be kept for conservation. How old is the house that's on it? I don't know the answer to that. That, that house, the, the house uh, oh, is a um, uh, World War II vintage, maybe a little earlier. It's a cape. Uh, just a word about uh, the condition. The condition is uh, it's very deteriorated. The uh, sills on the foundation are rotted. The, uh, uh, the heating system has been taken out uh, by the previous owner. It's in need of major uh, renovation uh, if it uh, is to be uh, occupied. Councillor uh, Carney and then Councillor Freeman Daniels. Um, when the contiguous property to the east the borders the river, there's a conservation restriction on that as well? So this was, if you remember, there was an odd deal we came to count on last year, something we hadn't done before. We purchased a 50% interest in that property. Mm -hmm. So the land, so this land is between the interstate and the railroad tracks. Right. The land abutting it to the south, Conservation Commission already owns a 50% interest. Right. And then between it and the river, there's the railroad tracks. And then beyond the railroad tracks, there's another parcel of land which we own a 50% interest in. So obviously, the railroad tracks prohibit public access. But from a wildlife standpoint, this is a riparian lot. So there is no conservation restriction on the contiguous property to the east? We own a 50% interest. We own a 50% interest in So it's preserved as conservation through the OK. So, that, so it's by our own, okay, our own restrictions. Right. So they, just to be clear, there's public access to both parcels. But you can't go from right. one parcel to the other without crossing the tracks that we would never encourage. Uh, Councillor Freeman Daniels and Councillor Tacey. So uh, can't we, can we put in uh, grand conservation restrictions to the Crestal Land Trust on any land so acquired? Uh, from a procurement standpoint, usually not. We always have to, at least if it's above a certain amount, we have to look at different uh, suppliers. They are often the sole bidder. But so we always go out. So as a practical matter, it's probably going to be them. You know, uh, Mass Audubon isn't interested away from their core area. You know, we've, we've gone through this process with all the local land trusts. But just to be totally above board, each year we're going to go through that process again. I have no reason not to assume we're going to select them every single year, but I can't guarantee you that it could be. You know, if the <coughs> coalition suddenly came to us and said, we'd hold a CR for $90 an acre, we have to. So I'm sorry, so this is a yearly fee. No, no, it's a one-time fee, but I'm saying for, for 2012 purchases, we haven't yet chosen our vendor. So we, you know, for all the past conservation pur purchases, we've used Kestrel. Each year, we're doing new conservation restriction. I'm anticipating it'll be Kestrel. But, so we don't, even though this is only six and a half acres, we're not going to do the CRs for just this parcel. We're going to look at all the acquisitions we do in 2012, and we're assigned a, a CR all weeks. It makes our life easier and their life easier. Councillor Tacey, and then Councillor Labarge. The, the piece that you talk about that we bought, that we own a 50%, that, that's the Skibiski piece we bought last year? That's correct. And have we had any movement on the other 50%? Not yet. Uh, Mr. Skibiski is considering what he wants to do. Um, Mr. who? Skibiski. Oh, yeah. 50%. So we, we acquired the Valley Land Fund's interest in it, 
Mr. Skabisky still owns the other 50%. From our standpoint, it's weird to have this joint ownership, but it's not going to be because we own it for conservation. He can't develop, so it's really in his interest to sell it to us at some point. Um, what did we, what, was it $11,000? We did an appraisal. Um, I believe it was $1,000 an acre, and then we paid 50% of that because we're getting 50% interest. So it was about $500 an acre, but I have to check my notes to see exactly what it was. Okay. All right, I, I just got, I have to see a map. Okay, we can definitely do that. We have Google Maps over here if you want to walk okay. around. Okay, so, um, Councilor. Yes, um, he's I'm, all shy. I'm concerned about hearing from our um, city treasurer, George Zerman, on the house itself, on the property, in the city looking at auctioning it off, but we're hearing it's in really deplorable condition. So why don't we just tear it down why are we not just tearing it down? This is actually a decision that I that it's my my decision to make, and, and it didn't seem reasonable to expend city monies tearing down a house. So our plan was to just not, sell it the way it just is. Just sell it as is. We'd we'd really li like to not have the house in our possession through the winter and have to deal with it. So our only interest is get, sell it, auction it, recover the the losses taxes, the legal fees, and all the other okay. interests. So that's why we decided to just do an auction. That's correct. Uh, as opposed to hiring a realtor, trying to fix up the, you know, it's just, it's it's so far gone that okay. we, yeah, we don't want to own any additional property. Okay. So, uh, so in finance, are we comfortable uh, voting on this recommendation in finance, knowing it's coming out to the full city council? And David. do we require the city treasurer to remain for the for the city no. council perch, or can he? No. Thank you very much, uh, George. Thank you very much. I make a motion we move this. Okay. So council. there's been a motion to recommend. All those in favor in finance say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So uh, that completes the f uh, orders in finance committee. Uh, in the interest of time, I don't think we have any pressing updates to provide no. uh, beyond that. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn the Finance Committee. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So now um, we will, uh, we have to move back now to this um, 8 p.m. Uh, poll petition hearing. Uh, and I will entertain a motion to open a petition uh, a hearing on a petition for joint or identical poll locations uh, this is a uh, national grid and Verizon this is number one two nine six five six four zero on Stonewall Drive is there a motion to open that hearing make a motion to open the hearing second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed okay um, is there a representative from the utility company here if you could just identify yourself uh, and step to the podium and if you could just describe the uh, the poll in question. My name is Rich Nileski. I work for National Grid as an engineering assistant. I work out of the Athol office. I'm filling in this evening for Lisa Jasinski, who probably you know, attends these hearings. Um, the uh, uh, poll 1-1, one one as uh, do, do you want me to explain the need sure. to poll? Poll 1-1, one one, uh, as is depicted on your uh, drawing there is needed to support a long service wire from uh, pole one to the picture house 462 and also to uh, alleviate an overhead trespass situation with that service wire okay are there any questions from the council about this particular poll okay um is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak uh in favor or against this particular poll petition okay seeing none one quick question: The 462—that's that, that, the dwelling unit. That's that. That's the dwelling box unit. Or, uh, that's okay. correct. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions about this uh, while we have the hearing open? Yes. Councilor. Um, looking at the memorandum from um, to Ned Huntley, on that page it states something to the effect, however based on our record drawings for the roadway an underground gas main may be located very close to the proposed pole location so what do you do with that national grid calls dig safe before any excavation is uh, started okay okay 
So, I want to know. are there any other questions? Okay, then I would entertain a motion to close the poll petition. Make a motion. Close. Second. All those in favor of closing say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And now I would entertain a motion to um, approve the Move petition. Second. second it. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the petition say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Have a safe trip back to Al. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry we didn't recognize you. We were looking for Lisa. <laughs> Certainly. Thank you. Um, so now we've completed the uh, we've completed finance committee, and I'm wondering if we could just take a five minute recess. So that we could just reset a couple of things. Five minute recess, and then we'll get right back to. Uh, five minutes. Was that done? That was already. We done. Why was already having a recess? Yeah. Sure. So we are uh, going to take a five minute recess. Well, did you hear the few poll when, when Koha did his thing? This is the biggest lead of anybody. Okay, welcome back to the September 20th, 2012 meeting of the Northampton City Council. We're coming out of a brief recess. Um, we're continuing on now with the regular agenda of the City Council. We Next on the agenda, we have four reports from committees that require your acceptance, uh, actually more than four. Um, we have the minutes of the Finance Committee for May 22nd, 2012 and August 1st, 2012. We have the Committee on Public Safety Minutes of July 2nd, 2012. We have the Committee on Elections, Rules, Ordinances, Orders, and Claims Minutes of July 9th, 2012. And we have the Transportation and Parking Commission Minutes of July 17th, 2012. Oh, as a group. I won't read them all. Then. I'll second them. Okay. Second. Um, all those in favor of accepting these minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, presentations. We've had that earlier in the evening. We now will take up um, the first is a financial order. Uh, this is an order of taking to acquire easement from Mass Electric for two access ramps to Manhattan, New Haven, and Northampton Rail Trail at Edward Square and King Street. It was passed for treating in 2010. 2011, it was postponed uh, from May 17th to September 6th upon the request of the Office of Planning and Development. Uh, there's now been a motion, uh, a request um, to, I think, I believe the proper request should be to postpone indefinitely. So there's been a request from the Planning Department to, to post, make we'll a motion. Move to postpone indefinitely. Okay. Second. 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 So there's been a motion made and seconded to postpone indefinitely. I believe we've already explained why the reasoning for that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so that one is finished. Uh, the next is, again, this is a uh, order which we just reviewed in the Finance Committee. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development, the Conservation Commission, and the Finance Committee. Uh, this, uh, I'll read the operative clause uh, that the City Council authorizes the Conservation Commission through its agent, the Office of Planning and Development, to accept donations and gifts to the conservation funds and to expend funds for the purchase of land and interest in land for open space purchases authorized by City Council, including conservation land and multi-use trails, for the maintenance and improvements to such open space and trails and for any other purposes authorized by NGL Chapter 40, Section 8C. Second. Is there any discussion on this uh, in the full council? Okay. Suspend rule 38. Oh, first we have to vote on our first oh, okay. reading. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, were, we, were we requesting a second reading on this? Yes. Okay. So suspend. suspend rule 38. Okay. Second. Uh, there's been a motion to suspend rule 14. 14. Uh, and it's been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Move Any abstention? Move the second reading. Okay. There's second. motion and seconded to uh, adopt this on second reading. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's adopted on second reading. The next item is upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development and the Finance Committee. Uh, this is, I'll read the operative clause. The City Council authorizes the City, acting through its Office of Planning and Development, to accept donations and gifts to the Tourism Gift Account and to expend such funds for artistic wayfinding signs and purposes in support of making Northampton more attractive, for which the donations were earmarked and accepted. Uh, move approval. Second it. Okay. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. I'd like to propose an amendment <coughs> that starts 
after the word account on the second line and uh, deletes the rest of the paragraph and, in, and inserts in its stead four artistic wayfinding signs. Um, I'll second. Is that the number four or? Oh, uh, the word. For the purpose of. For the purpose of. The pro just, okay. Yes. All right. Just was curious. So the, it would read, it would read, the city council authorizes the city acting through its office of planning and development to accept donations and gifts to the tourism gift account for artistic wayfinding signs. But not the, ex but no expenditure. There. Just, just, just want to read that one. So tourism gift account, did you get? Okay. So what's deleted is, and to expend such funds for artistic wayfinding signs and purposes in support of making Northampton more attractive for which the donations were earmarked and accepted. And that's what he's, the amendment, as I understand it. Okay. So is there a second on the amendment? Second. Okay. So there's been an amendment made and seconded. Councilor Spector. Just if uh, the councilor could explain the reasons behind the uh, amendment. Uh, so, so again, I made a, I made the comment earlier, and actually maybe maybe we should change it a little bit differently. But I made the comment earlier that I under, I I like the idea of accepting gifts for um, making Northampton more attractive, um, but I do think the council should have greater oversight over how the funds are expended. Uh, and so this is an this as it as it currently reads is an open-ended uh, approval. Uh, and so we did have some discussion about thresholds or is it burdensome on small projects? Well, all projects have to be approved by the council. We might want to entertain the idea that maybe projects for of under a certain amount or projects of a certain type might uh, might be written in, into uh, automatic approval. But until that time occurs, really what we're talking about is the wayfinding signs. So I believe that uh, we should authorize the... Uh, the use of funds for the wayfinding signs, and that's it. Um, wasn't there a concern? Uh, the chair. Sure. Wasn't there a concern also about the gateway signs? All right, you did. I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm sorry. I, I don't believe the gateway signs are, are imminent at all. We don't need to. The, the, we, we have months and months to consider those signs and to authorize their ex the expenditure for them. And I, actually, it's probably unlikely that those gateway signs will be f will be at all gifted to the city um, by my understanding so I, I'm not worried about those and I don't, I don't I don't think any count I don't think any so far as I know those signs are not there there's they're not imminent to be spent uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong counselor they're not what excuse me the, the the funds are are not ready to to buy those wayfinding signs the uh, welcome to Northampton signs the gateway the gateway oh, yeah, signs. Yeah, I'd like to recognize uh, Wayne. To He's been recognized. So They're now fine. consular. So, um, as I understand the amendment, it would authorize us to accept donations, which we don't think we need your authority for. It wouldn't authorize us to expend the funds. Oh, no. It, it, I'm sorry. For the signs. Right. Shouldn't it, it, it should, uh, the way I mean to read it is that it would authorize to expend funds for the wayfinding signs. Oh, okay. I mean, obviously, you know, I'd like it to be broader, but we have no other projects, so that's not a crisis for, for our standpoint. Right. The, my understanding is the gateway signs are going to be totally privately fundraised, and that money is not coming to the city. So, right. so at this point, it's really just about the art installation. If I can ask the councilor to amend the language so oh. that it will reflect that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I thought that's what I did. Maybe I missed. Could I? So I guess what we'll say is uh, to expend funds for artistic wayfinding signs. Is that? Right, so now it re the deletion now reads, and purposes in support of making Northampton more attractive for which donations were earmarked and accepted. Yeah. That's the part you're deleting. I guess, I guess we'll just have to move that past it. To, okay, to so the then your, the amendment, you want to make a friendly amendment to your amendment uh, to uh, to retract a little of the deletion and have it end after signs? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, okay. Okay, so we're still on that amendment. Is there any further discussion about it? Um, just as a clarification, and that's with the understanding that we may move forward with some policy that may include a thresholding mm -hmm. or some other conditional language for um, for the purposes of being able to expend small donations that would come through the planning office. 
Council. I, I yeah, I, I am. I'm not opposed to that myself personally as a, uh, or I mean, sorry, as a counselor, I think that um, if if there's a uh, if there's a donation of under a certain amount, we might we might just adopt a policy for it, or or if it may not an amount may not be the actual threshold, we could have a policy that says, uh, you know, street signs and park benches and bike racks and so on and so forth are okay, but anything that doesn't look like those, we'd like to have approval on, could we regardless do that of, of, of size. Could we do that through the participants through working with the planning department to come up with something that's mm -hmm. uh, most workable? Are, are you my, willing my to work with, yeah, are you I, willing yeah, to yeah, work with a, uh, Wayne fine, yeah. for that? Mm -hmm. Councilor Speck. Yeah, I just, I was going to say the same thing. I'm not comfortable supporting this amendment tonight, but I would be happy, I may be happy to support it in the second reading um, if it, if you want to bring it up then. But I, I'd like to see some more work done on threshold and other things. Because again, I, I want to make sure that we're not, we're not just adding to, to layers here, as Councilor Schwartz spoke earlier. Um, so I'd like to know that it, it's, it's something that in a practical sense is going to be workable. So I'd, I'd like to see it come back next time. We are requesting two readings. We're, we're hoping to install the sign in November. So time is critical for us. So, so you would like two readings tonight? Yes. But we could come back and visit. The council has the right to come back and visit. But what you're saying is you're we, we all will be discussing our rules and regulations, and it might not be inappropriate to discuss signs. And maybe if there's a proposal before the, the Ordinance and Rules Committee, that this be one of the ones that be considered during the course of that. Discussion. Okay. Couldn't this would also, that. couldn't this amendment come again to us at the second reading? Oh, he's with, requesting with two the readings the tonight. Reading oh, tonight. it's tonight. Did so. <laughs> <laughs> you guys work together you for a few minutes? Uh, <laughs> uh, Councilor Tacey has a question about the amendment, I assume, about the amendment that's on the table. Yeah, I, I actually intend to support the amendment at this point because we've had a lot of discussion about gifts, you know, at Transportation and Park. We've, we've had discussion about gifts everywhere and gift accounts, and, um, and I don't want to stop the process for the wayfinding I mean there's been there has been a lot of work and, and, and if I'm fine with that um, but I think we need a little more discussion with some policy or something on on gifts on how you accept gifts how we go about it and put them all together in the city and have a particular policy because we don't we have no direction we have how many gift accounts do we have we have them everywhere um, so anyway uh, I intend to support the amendment because I want to see this, the wayfinding signs happen when they're supposed to. But um, uh, and I'll, I'll stop. Okay. Uh, Councilor Labarge? I'm, I'm going to support this amendment 100%. I think Owen Freeman Daniels has, did, has done a good job as far as this amendment. And I'm not having a problem with it. I have to agree with what I'm hearing from Councillor Tacey about all these GIF accounts. And I don't know why this is happening with all these GIF accounts. I mean, we've got them everywhere. So I will support this amendment because of the second reading. And I have to agree with Councillor Carney. There are ways that we could go ahead and make a change. Well, just to be clear, the amendment doesn't take into account all the various gifts, doesn't say anything about that. This is just very specific on one thing. So uh, I'm not ready yet. I'd like to see it fleshed out. And I, if, if it's possible, as um, the council president said, that this could be something we take up at a later date and we really come up with more of a policy, I would support that. So I, I don't really have a problem with the amendment. But right now, I'd like to see it be clearer. I'd like to see a threshold. So I would not support it this evening, but I probably would support it at a later date because I think there is a way to, to write this. And I, th I thank you for bringing it up. Okay, so then the question is on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor of sub roll call? supporting the amendment, uh, say aye, and we, I'll ask the clerk to call? call the roll. Yeah. Council Adams? Yes. Council Carney? No. Council Tacey? No. Yes. Aye. Council yes. Murphy? No. Councilor Stecker? No. Councilor Schwartz? No. Councilor Tacey? Yes. 
So the amendment is adopted by a five to four vote. So now we're back to the main uh, question before you, which is the, the primary order. Um, is there any further comment on this order as amended? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Move to suspend Rule 14. Okay. It's been seconded. Second. All those in favor of suspending rules say aye. 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 Opposed? Move the question okay. for the second reading. Okay. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded on second reading. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that one is adopted as amended. Okay, so this is the um, order that we uh, just finished discussion in finance. This is uh, now therefore be it ordered that the City Council authorizes the City acting through its Office of Planning Development to accept donations, gifts, and payments to the traffic mitigation account and further. And then it provides a list that we review of the various projects um, that uh, are requesting this authorization for expenditure. I would first entertain a motion to approve. So second seconded so now it's on the floor before you um, is there any discussion Councilor? thank you um, yeah I'd like to amend this to uh, to delete uh, most of the items with the exception of 46,456 for South Street $91,040 for River Valley Market and seven thousand dollars for traffic calming and mitigation in the Lee's neighborhoods north of Florence Street. Uh, Councillor, so is that the, does that complete your amendment? I think, yeah. I'm, okay. Yes. You had <laughs> mentioned yeah, earlier that, that the VA medical yeah. center was one. Oh, I'm sorry. And ten thousand. Yeah, I mean, uh, ten thousand five hundred and four for the, the the second item, the second bullet on this. Okay. There's been an amendment made. Is there a second to the amendment? Second. second. Seconded by Councillor Adams. So now discussion on the amendment. Councillor. There's a discussion on the amendment and a, a request that the amendment be withdrawn. Uh, and here's, here would be the reasoning. Would it be possible to move forward on a first reading of all of these? And then I would support that we only take a second reading on the ones that you mentioned and that the others not have a second reading yet. And that we come back and, and, and is that enough time in the next two weeks to settle any issues that we may have, try and get any further information that feels like it's not there? It, it may or may not be. It may be on second reading that these don't pass. But I would like to sep pass them all on the first reading. I thought we were going to separate those that needed a second reading, go ahead and vote for those. And then there's a whole group that we would not take a second reading on tonight. So there's. An amendment on the floor that's been seconded. So the amendment could be withdrawn or um, or amended, but uh, <laughs> well, if it's amended, easier it's to vote on the amendment or not vote on the amendment, and then a so second amendment could be made to divide the question. Go ahead. So during this, this is discussion. Um, I, th I think that's that's not a bad compromise. Um, the only the only concern I have, I mean. Look, this can be any one of these can be introduced at any time, uh, at the next meeting or the meeting thereafter or the meeting thereafter. Um, I personally would like to review, and I think it's good policy to review each one of them, and we haven't even gotten through all of them. So I don't know if even some of them. I know that um, Director Fiden indicated that some of them are even sketchier. So I don't. I don't even want to pass some of them on first reading it. Um, so. I guess my, my sense is if we wait, we know that some of them are, in, are imminent. Let's pass those. If we wait on some of the other ones, it's not because we're, we won't be stifling any good, any good ideas or good projects. It just might be that we might have uh, at, at 1030 at night, we might have, we might have, um, we might not want to go through every single one of them. So can, I, I'm can not going to let Can we direct on. this to? Uh... Well, the one that's most pressing is also the, the King Street uh, rail trail pieces that we'd like to go forward mm -hmm. on those pieces. Killing me. So I'm going to add to my amendment. <laughs> so just so we can clarify, um, you would like to do, you would like to retain the projects that you would like to retain and not delete are the 10,504 second bullet, which is the the uh, park and ride lots, 
um, the uh, was the Grove Street one? The Grove well. Street. The street, the five thousand five seven seven nine fifty three for Grove Street. We're ready to go forward on that. There's no crisis if we don't. So, that so that one. Okay, the forty six four fifty six thirty two for South Street. Yep. Um, the one eighty three and eight dollars for the Lower King Street projects. Uh, the ninety one thousand forty for River Valley Market, and then seven thousand of the proposed forty seven plus. Right for the uh, Leeds neighborhood north of Florence Street. So all of the others you would remove from I, I stand, I mean, if, if there's another one that's imminent, then I feel as though I want to do that. OK. Uh, so you got, I'm sorry, I, I may have spaced out. You got the one about Grove Street is in. Yes, yes, okay. yes. 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 So, that's, so that's the amendment that we're discussing now. Uh, I guess you've you've made a friendly another friendly amendment to your amendment, so um, so we'll we'll go with that. Is there a discussion on the amendment, Councilor? Yeah, I'm back to one of the reasons we have a second vote, and you may absolutely be right that the two weeks is not enough time. We won't clarify any more of these things, but we can do a couple of things. We can postpone indefinitely the next vote. We just saw one that came from when was that? Two two years ago. So we could decide. Let's just postpone the vote. So if we I just don't see any reason. This, this is why we have a second reading. We're not like Congress where we do one reading. It's for this very reason. And it may very well be you go and you, you talk with the planning board, you talk with other people and say, you know what? I'm even more against it than I was tonight. But uh, you know, I think we move ahead. And one of the things we don't usually do on this council, I haven't seen done a lot, is use this second vote the way it was prescribed to be used, which is it is a time where I've got some concerns. I may have an amendment. Let me clean up the amendment. Let's postpone this. Let's talk with each other about it. So I would still say I, I won't support the amendment, but it, it's not a, it's not a big thing for me. It's just I, I think there's a reason we have this second vote, and I think that it's something we could start. The the process is in place, and we could start using it more when we have concerns. Councilor, uh, the uh, councilor, the only yeah. the only counsel I would give you is suppose it's imp it's possible that those others don't survive the first vote. Then, of course, then, then. Um, they might not. They might not. They might not. Well, that, it's, that's true. They might not. I, I, I mean, I think we're arguing process, but the fact is is that uh, 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 Director Fiden can bring these forward um, in, 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 in call for two readings, in fact, actually, and make the case uh, as needed Rather than, I personally, rather than take the risk of it not surviving the first reading and then, and then sort of like get a wounded duck out there and the next time he has to come back and just. Theoretically, you're correct, but <laughs> I've also been on this council for a long time and I, I, I would, okay. I would uh, so I what, did, what did Mitt Romney say, 10,000 bucks? I bet you the 10,000 bucks it'll pass <laughs> for you in winter without. I have Councilor Tacey waiting and then Councilor okay. Carney. Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support the amendment. I think the second. For the first reading, I think we need to have a little more specifics before you can even vote on something. Um, and that is, and I don't want to look as though, I mean, it's $300,000 uh, worth of expenditures in this whole, the laundry list here. And uh, I don't want to look like, I hate, pardon the term, but like a rubber stamp, like we're just going to vote this through, especially when it call, it does call for, for a second reading. And I, I, I would like to have two readings on several of these because I know that they need to get they get, get moving. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm going to support the amendment um, uh, for the one, two, three, four, five five items that we picked out here. So, I want to be able to look at something a little more in detail. Councilor Kearney. Yeah. Um, just to speak with to what Councilor White just said, I think that um, those that do not support the amendment could uh, and most likely would uh, support the entire package then if it came forward. So the only reason that it does not pass if those that feel so strongly about the amendment that they would kill all the rest would choose to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's the only scenario. But I can see that that would be a very likely possibility if those that feel so strongly about this amendment would choose to kill the rest of these projects for time indefinitely. Um, 
for that principled stand. I, I withdraw my amendment. You're withdrawing the amendment. Okay, so the amendment is withdrawn. Uh, and we're back to the main motion. Uh, so I don't know if you wanted to speak to the... Okay. So, Councillor. Can I just remind you of what you discussed in finance, which is a third option of splitting the question. So that way people can still take a principled stand against the ones that aren't included. Yeah. We're going to do that. Uh, okay. I, I'm gonna, it's going to be proposed on the second vote. Oh, I was discussing it now. Yes. So right. 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 Yep. right. We're going to take a first vote on all, yeah. and so the so second vote we're going to split. Transparency and strategy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. now it's that has my question is, why are we doing two readings on all of these? Not all. Not all. We're going to, there's a, we're doing a first reading on all of them. I think we're, we're going to do two readings because the order comes like this. It comes in a chunk. But um, I, no, but I intend on the second reading to do to the yes. same amendment that I offered. That's not my question. My question is, these ordinances came to us city councilors, and if I can recall, Councilor Owen Daniel Freeman, you had great concerns about two readings in one night. This whole packet of all these orders you don't have to do them all tonight. are two readings. No. Right. I mean, was it very detrimental that these second readings all had to be done tonight? So that way, councilors could do all the researching like I agree with Councillor Spector and Maureen Carney and I, it's like, it seems like it's just pushed right on us. So, so and there are some questions to be asked here. The, the reason for the split, the, the six which Councillor Freeman Daniels talked about, because this is a change in advice from city solicitors, some of these projects have contracts that are signed and so they're underway. So the six are important to separate so that we can address those things. Mm -hmm. The other ones there's no hurry for. Um, if, if I may, just a point of information. What's about to happen is that we're going to divide the question. No, first so, I mean, one, I, vote. I, or one vote, but then one after vote. that, the question will be divided, broken apart, yes. so that the second reading will occur for the ones that need to be uh, addressed promptly, and then the other ones will lie dormant until the next meeting, until such time that uh, some information is presented okay. for us. Moves the question. Okay, so. Um, on first reading, then, of the main motion, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. 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 Move to suspend rule Okay, 14. so wait, I just need to clarify. There are two nays. I, two, two nays. Okay. And seven. Wait ayes. a minute. I thought we were, Mayor, we were just voting on the amendment that no, he withdrew his amendment. amendment. was withdrawn. Yeah, he withdrew the amendment. So we're, we voted on first reading. Uh, so that was first reading. It was adopted seven to two on first reading. Um, Move to suspend, suspend rule 14. Second. Okay. There's been a motion made to suspend rules. Uh, any aye. discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So move to separate out six. No, we have to move the. We, we oh. have to move the question again. Oh. I move the question with the separation of six projects. So you want to move second reading yes. on only. You want to divide, essentially divide it up and yes. move it forward with six projects that were That's discussed correct. earlier for second read. Right. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> six. Okay. And so then we'll have to revisit the remaining ones uh, in two okay. weeks. Two weeks at second, second read. Yes. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to single out those six projects and only take a second reading on those projects tonight. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Those are adopted, and we'll have to return for the remaining projects on second reading at our next meeting. Right. And poor Mary has to sort it out on paper. Yeah. Figure <laughs> some things. Okay. So the um, that completes our financial orders for this evening. Uh, we now have an order before you. Um, <laughs> oh goodness. No, uh, no it's, it's not a financial order. It's a property order. Okay. So we'll go ahead and do the next item, which is a straight order. This is um, in City Council upon the recommendation of City Council President William H. White, ordered that a special election be held in November, on November 6, 2012.
and that the following question be placed on the ballot pursuant to and in accordance with section 47 chapter 277 of the act of 2012 shall an act entitled quote an act revising the charter for the city of northampton be accepted Move to yes sir okay second so there's been a motion made and seconded uh for second reading um and as you'll note we do have a bill number now because the bill has actually been adopted by the legislature and signed by the Should governor so there's now an actual act of the legislature that we need to fill in. Yes. is there any discussion or debate on this particular question okay hearing none all those in favor say aye. Aye. aye aye opposed any abstentions okay so that is adopted on second reading okay um for the next item uh so the next item before you uh, would be an order um, regarding the city electing to engage in a process to change health insurance benefits. Um, I though before uh, moving into that uh, discussion, as the chair, I have to issue the following ruling that we, uh, this council lacks a quorum uh, due to conflicts related to the order before you. Um, but uh, in accordance with a ruling from the State Ethics Commission, um, that, that uh, lack of a quorum could be satisfied uh, by the invocation of the rule of necessity by those counselors who have conflicts. So in order to proceed on this particular item, and you were provided with a copy of mm -hmm. the State Ethics Commission ruling, uh, we'll need to have those members who do have a conflict to identify the conflict and um, invoke the rule of necessity. Um, the rules, rule of necessity, just for those at home, states that when you have a decision that can only be made by a body, um, and that body lacks a quorum because of conflicts, the rule of necessity necessitates that they make that decision, so they are allowed to invoke that and, and actually be able to act on it. So I would recognize the council president. I, uh, I do have a conflict. I have insurance for the city for my family, and as such, that's the extent of my, uh, of my conflict. And I, and, I, and I don't know, I don't get to claim the, the invocation of the rule of necessity. I believe that's essentially decided by it. You will be. But I, my plan is to debate so you will and vote deliberate on this. Yeah, to, yeah. to participate in the, in the vote, OK? I have the same conflict. I have health insurance through the city. My family does, and I invoke the rule as well. Okay. Councilor Schwartz? Likewise, similar conflict. I invoke the rule of necessity. Okay. So that's through. Councilor Rattles? I have city health insurance for myself. I invoke the rule of necessity. Okay. And uh, I do as well. Okay. So and you I invoke the rule of necessity. Okay. <laughs> so, um, those members having one more. having uh, one more yeah. oh excuse me too Councilor. <laughs> okay. so do you want to go ahead and just state I, yeah i uh utilize the city's health plan for an individual okay. and uh so i would un otherwise be unable to uh, vote on this matter okay so you also okay so um having having done that uh, i now detect the presence of a quorum we now have a quorum uh and so we are able to proceed um uh, with this, the next question, which is an order um, in City Council upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Markowitz, ordered that the City of Northampton elects to engage in the process to change health insurance benefits under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 32B, Section 21-23. And I would ask for a, a motion to um, adopt that for purposes of discussion. Move to approve. Move, move to approve. Move to approve. Second. second. Motion made and seconded. Um, I have a presentation that I will just briefly go through with you. Um, just going through the um, going through why I'm bringing this forward to you, uh, and I will um, as soon as we call that up, um, we'll go through it. We provided information to you in the packet, um, including some information that provides sort of a timeline. Um, this is the Acts, uh, Chapter 69 of the Acts of 2011 that was adopted by the legislature last year, signed into law by uh, Governor Patrick. Um, we can go to the next slide. The 
the, the basic summary of what this, the, what this uh, new law does, this new local option does, is that after it's accepted locally, um, the, uh, the appropriate municipal public authority, in this case the executive in our city, uh, may follow a process that's prescribed by the law in order to make health insurance plan design changes or to transfer uh, the community into the state's group insurance commission. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so the two key parts are plan design and group insurance commission. So plan design essentially are those aspects of the various aspects of the plan that include co-pays, prescription drugs, um, deductibles, emergency room co-pays, hospitalization. So those, those would be the elements of plan design that we'd be discussing. And again, this does not have anything to do with the percentage that employees pay uh, for health insurance relative to the city or any of those things. It's just plan design issues. And then the second issue is the GIC, which is the, um, which is the state's group insurance commission. Um, since 2007, municipalities have had the ability, uh, were given the authority to move into the GIC plan. Uh, that initial process was somewhat um, was somewhat difficult, and so they've now added this other option through 21-23. So the GIC basically is all the insurance that's offered to state employees, UMass, et cetera. Um, there's currently 35 cities and towns that are participating in the GIC, including in our area, Springfield, Pittsfield, Munson, and Orange. You can also see we have several uh, school districts in our region, as well as the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is in the GIC. Um, the GIC essentially, uh, the state negotiates with a set of insurance companies, offers a set of plans that employees can choose uh, to opt into, a Medicare plan uh, for retirees, um, it's all administered by the state. They set the rates. They negotiate the rates, et cetera. So that's the other piece that can be done uh, through this new, um, th this new law that we're asking you to accept. You can go to the next slide. So what's the process? Um, and I included a, a longer flow chart in your packet, but the first step is adopting the new law, essentially allowing us to engage in the process. So this is the first step that would be required before we could even entertain moving into the process. So it essentially um, a vote of the Board of Selectmen to the City Council. The next step that would happen is, if this were adopted for us to engage in the process, is we'd have to prepare a proposal. We'd have to seek bids. We'd have to look at, are there ways that we could um, make plan design changes to find savings in our health insurance, or would it, or it, would it be advantageous for us, would we be able to find savings by moving into the GIC? Um, so essentially the next step would be we'd have a discussion with, with the IAC, which is our insurance advisory committee, um, which, uh, the, why don't you flip to the next slide actually, we'll just skip ahead to that. There's currently an insurance advisory committee that we work with um, and, and to echo the comments that were made in, in public comment, it's been, a, a, it's been a collaborative effort to work with employees through the insurance advisory committee to look at how can we, um, how can we Nego uh, work on improving the city's health care plan or trying to find cost savings. Uh, that plan, that, that committee has a representative of each bargaining unit and plus one retiree. It only has a consultative role. It makes recommendations. Um, so if you want to just flip back to the next, to the previous slide, what, the, um, what this new process does is it retains the IAC. Um, so there's a, a discussion with the IAC but then it also creates, uh, once a proposal is, is sent to the IAC, it then calls for the formation of a public employee committee. Um, you can, I'm sorry to be bouncing back, but <laughs> go to that next slide. So the public employee committee is a new uh, formation that, under the state law, which again has representatives of all the bargaining units. It's weighted, however, to the number of employees. So there's, uh, there's votes are weighted by the number of employees. And then there's a 10% of that weighted vote goes to retirees. And they're actually a decision-making body that negotiates over these plan design changes. So there's a 30-day negotiation period that happens uh, between uh, the city and this PEC. Um, and again, we have to provide information about the proposed, either the proposed plan design changes or the move to the GIC. 
Um, and, uh, and then the benchmark that's used throughout this is the GIC itself, are the GIC benchmark plans that we have to be able to show that we can put together a plan that's comparable to or better than that GIC plan as the benchmark. Um, uh, and so that, that, that all happens. Then there's a final step. If there's, if, if there's unable to reach an agreement during that 30-day process, uh, between the, the PEC and the city, there's then this final, um, why don't we go to the next slide. Um, so, the, so we prepare a proposal, um, we go ahead and we, we, we put forward the proposal, we talk about the savings that we can develop, uh, we could realize in the next 12 months. And the other important piece of that is we also have to show how that savings, 25% of that savings could be shared with employees in the first year to mitigate any, any switch into a, new, into a new proposal. So you can go to the next slide. So again, we've notified the IAC, we're working, we're providing them information on it and going through the proposal. Then the next step, you can go to the next slide, is to move into this negotiation with the, um, with the uh, public employee committee. Um, you can see that we provide them a proposal there's then a 30-day negotiation period, and the goal is to achieve a written agreement um, during that 30 days. And you can see it describes the vote process that's used to go ahead and reach the agreement. Um, you can go to the next slide. If there's not agreement um, in that 30 days, uh, then there's a there's a there's a, a next step, which is an arbitration, almost an arbitration step, where a review panel is formed. Uh, it's a three-member panel. The PEC appoints one member, the city appoints one member, and the state appoints. Well, the state provides a list of three neutral members, which have to be agreed on mutually. If we can't agree on, then the state selects the third member. The third neutral member is the chair. Mm -hmm. They then have the task of reviewing this negotiation and, and making a determination. Um, and there are some further benchmarks related to um, to what they have to use to make that deliberation. And those meetings are subject to open meeting law. So that's an open meeting discussion. Counselor. Who, who from the state? Uh, the of Department of Administration and Finance. Thank you. Uh, which oversees this, so the Administration and Finance. And are these, the, I'm sorry, the, the neutral people, are they, are they from the city? Are they just from the state? Are names they that are select, three names that are selected by the state. So I do, they could be state officials. They could, I don't okay. know who they would be, but are there's- Guys at a bus stop? I don't know, but they provide three. I will say, and if you read through the materials that I provided, that in the year that the law has been in effect, there have been some 130 communities that have opted in. There's only been one that have gone to this third step. Uh, so Short far. list then. What's that? A short list. I suppose it's a short list, but so it, it hasn't actually been invoked very often. This final step. Again, I think the goal is to provide a clear and sure and a time frame so that this so that this negotiation happens in a very controlled time frame, and then there's this other uh, process at the end to oversee it. Um, so you can go to the next slide. This is just a, um, this is actually a slide that I showed you when I was doing the budget presentations around the city, which shows the growth of our health insurance uh, costs over the last uh, 10 fiscal years. You can see where we were in FY 2003, spending about $6 million on our health insurance. You can see that that's been a number that's been really increasing over time. Uh, we, this in fiscal year 2013, we'll be cresting 10 million for the first time in terms of our health insurance costs. Uh, again, $76 million uh, um, general fund budget. Uh, so we're 10 million of that is going towards health insurance. So it's doubled in 10 years. What's that? It's doubled in 10 years. It's been a it's been a it's been a growth. But I will say I think we've done a good job. Uh, and again, working with employees to try to look at ways that we could modify um, in, and and keep our costs down relative to the growth of health insurance generally. Um, you may recall last year we reached a point where we'd sort of run out of ways that we could um, change the plan that we had uh, before us. There were some other plans that we wanted to look at um, that were, again, similar to GIC type plans. But the time that we required under the current system to be able to have to try to negotiate individually with each particular union to try to reach those in the time that we needed to get that completed for open enrollment for the budget made it very difficult. 
uh, to do. So that's one of the impetuses of this law is to create a more streamlined effort that allows you to look, have a benchmark, which is the state's approved health insurance plans, and use those as a benchmark that if cities and towns can provide the same level that the state benchmark is using, then we're allowed to move into that. Um, go to the next slide, because what we've done now is we've put the GIC up against um, Northampton. So Northampton is still in red, and the GIC per percentage of change, you can sort of track how that's gone over the last um, several years. And, the, and on the left is percentage increases or decreases. You can see we've tracked them fairly well, but then as you get closer here to FY 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, you can see that our costs have been going up. The GIC have been able to contain their costs. This last uh, year, uh, their increase was only 1.7%. Ours was in the neighborhood of 7 or 8%. So, so that's, the, that's sort of the challenge. If you, I think there's one more slide. Uh, one more slide. This is the Mass Taxpayers Foundation has set up this computer generation uh, sequence, which you can go in, you can put in your town, and they actually do a 10-year look at the GIC versus your particular town, and they're using DOR expenditure numbers. And so you put in our town, and it says, it's, it's a little bit inaccurate, because it says over 10 years, we could have saved $3.6 million. It's inaccurate because we were only allowed to go into the GIC since 2007, but they're still looking at a span. And they're saying that it would be an average annual savings of 363196 So, So that's just looking at how the state, and again, they, we're, we have 900 employees. Um, we're negotiating with health insurance companies. Um, they're, they have millions of employees, and they're using that negotiating power on behalf of the entire state to, to negotiate for, for rates. So, so that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difference in terms of the scale that they're working on. So the vote that I'm at asking you to take is not to go into the GIC, it's not to make plan design changes, it's not to commit to any of those things, but it allows the city to engage in this new process. Um, it allows us to have that option to be able to uh, work with our employees under this new framework um, and again, if, we've, if we're able to determine that the GIC, for example, is a good option, it gives us a way to do that expeditiously. And we're able to actually, again, we have to prove that there's an analysis that we can prove that the savings are there, and then it gives us a, a path to be able to do that. So that's what this particular uh, law is about. And December 1st is that. And, and so, for example, and this has been one of the issues, this year, we have to notify the state by December 1st if we intend to move into the GIC. Um, and that's been one of the issues in the past is, uh, I think it used to be October 1st. You used to have to notify them by October 1st. Um, we would, be, you know, which would require you to do a lot of bargaining around that issue in the summertime leading up to that event. And it made it very difficult to actually get through that process and be able to do it by October 1st. The other hurdle I'll mention about the GIC is they, um, they don't actually announce what their rates are going to be till the spring. So we, we ha we're, we're going to try to do some analysis. We have a health care consultant that does some analysis with us. We're going to try to look at what would, what would happen if we took our current plan and employees and moved into the GIC or moved into some other plans, do an analysis to try to come up with a plan that we can then present to the IAC to say these are the options. So we're not committing to anything, but we, this gives us the ability to, to make a change using this new process if we want to. Counselor. I, I'm assuming you're finished. I'm finished, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> this has been a long, uh, we know that this process came before the state a year ago, highly contentious. Um, uh, generally speaking, the broader labor movement was severely opposed to what seemed like a comparison with Wisconsin politics in terms of taking health care out of collective bargaining. Um, it was a long and le long legislative process that did result in the end in uh, July of a compromise settlement and one that um, uh, actually, the Paul Toner, the president of the Mass Teachers Association, called, um, he said, in the end, neither the unions nor the municipalities got everything they wanted. That's what genuine negotiations look like. 
And I do understand that at that level, um, they were able to come to some compromise. However, at a local level here where the rubber meets the road, I am, I am very concerned with um, the fact that though we have sent out notifications to the numerous bargaining units, we haven't heard anything back. I, I'm not saying that that's anyone's fault, and it could be a mail glitch or it could be something that happens there, but it's clearly something that really, I think, needs to be discussed. I think there needs to be um, over-the-table conversations well in advance of my feeling comfortable uh, taking, taking an uh, approval of this, because just because we can, the state legislation says we can, I'm not convinced that we should at this point. We have heard, as uh, the president of the Northampton Education Association, school employees, has is, is, uh, voiced, we've seen employees really um, <coughs> come to the table and uh, put everything out there and taken those, taken those hits, really, at a time when the city really need them. We've seen other bargaining units that refuse to, and I understand why that you know, presents a real problem for the city. Um, but I'm, I'm at this point a, a bit uncomfortable taking this position until there have been, or, or uh, what seem to be at least conversations about what that would entail. I think that there's a lot of, there could be a lot of uh, real fright. I mean, frankly, what this says is that we have had, we saw the graph that showed that there are soaring high costs. That's the problem. It's not that the city has been extremely generous in giving out health insurance to city employees. In fact, we've come more and more to represent more of even the private sector, even though most of us know that people go into the public sector in many ways because they take lower cuts, they take a cut in pay, and they end up s sometimes with better retirement and better health insurance, and they make that trade off. So at this point, I, I think short of having some more in-depth conversations for, through your office, hopefully, whether it's um, rather than waiting for a response back, maybe doing some more proactive outreach to the various bargaining units and sitting down and getting an understanding of what their concerns are about this, I would um, actually oppose at this moment and before a second reading and hope to hear back in the meantime that there have been some um, some negotiations. Could I, could I just address one? Could I answer one question? Please. We had, and that was just the uh, issue of notification, because the law does require prior, and you probably saw it on your MMA sheet, the law does require that you, we notify all the bargaining units, and we have to give them two days' notice, and we have to do it by certified mail. Um, and so we actually sent out certified letters. We have all the certified slips that we did that last week. Uh, we wanted to give more than two days. We wanted to make sure that there was enough time. Um, and we did that last week, and we also sent it regular mail just as well um, in case people didn't, like, get the, go to the post office to get the letter. They'd at least get it directly. So we had two different ways to notify. Um, and I, you know, I, I signaled that I'd be doing this in my budget message, but I wanted to wait till after the summer when all of our employees were back. So. Your point is well taken, and I'm definitely willing to try to reach out and talk to them between now and, and the second reading on this to try to get feedback, because um, we have not received much feedback on it. Um, and I'm hoping the article in the newspaper, as well as tonight's debate, will give us some feedback on it. Um, but again, it, your point is well taken. Thank you. Uh, so I think I had Councillor Schwartz and then Councillor Labarge. I just want to underscore my comprehension that we're talking about voting on a, engaging in a process. That, that we're not adopting what the GIC will look like as applied in Northampton, per se. We're starting a conversation. Have I got that right? Well, it allows the city to, to, to work within this process that, that's been set up under this new law that was set up in 2011. So it allows us to do that, to, to negotiate in the parameters that are set up by that law. We still have, you're, you're allowed to still negotiate the old way, the new way. Uh, it doesn't commit us to moving to the GIC. It doesn't commit right. to okay. We still have to actually go through the process uh, and all those th th several steps that we would have to go through. Point of information, uh, th this, though, as I understand, is the only point that the council has to bite at the, that apple. You're correct. 
because the council does not negotiate right. uh, so the, the only thing that we're health insurance. The, the, so you this have, vote is our own yeah. bite of the apple where we get to weigh in whether to grant the authorization. You're correct. Yes. Yes. So Councillor right. Schwartz still has. So I, I just, uh, based on the presentation and um, and our our fiscal situation and the and the and what the overwhelming need to address this health care crisis in our community as a microcosm of our entire nation i support this effort and this process and i and i um i'm happy with my bite at the apple to say go forth and let's try to figure this out okay so i had count sort of a, a follow-up uh, follow clarification because i'm not sure even though it does not obligate us to and through the chair to the counselor doesn't obligate us to go move into the gic what this will do is allow us unilaterally to require um, entry into the GIC, which is, I think, the concern the bargaining units may have. I understand. Okay, thank you. Councilor? I have some concerns just hearing um, from the president of the Teachers Association and their bargaining unit, her not even receiving anything even a registered mail or any type of mailing that was sent by the city and having such a short notice, I have a problem with that. And we heard it from her tonight that she got it just, what, a couple of days ago, today. So something's not right, Mayor, if you're not hearing either from other bargaining units. Well, uh, again, as I said, the. We, we were required to send out the notice by certified mail, return receipt, and that's what we did. We obviously can't compel people to actually receive it or, or when they get it, we can't, you know, we, we did it well before that to allow time for them to, to so that's what we tried to comply with the law. Um, so I can't really, we can try to investigate what might have happened in that particular instance, but we complied with the letter of the law and we did it more than the two days we we actually sent it out last week not this week um, so, so what we're doing right now is that we're allowing we're going to go ahead and vote to allow to engage in the process yeah. that's it it's opening up that window and then that process if passed would allow the mayor to go ahead and go into negotiations with all the bargaining units, correct? Uh, through this new, st we, new we currently do negotiate with all the bargaining units under one chapter 150, which right. is collective bargaining. This creates a different pathway uh, specifically for health insurance and specifically for plan design and GIC. And it creates a new process that I've described with the formation of this new committee, the 30 day period, the review panel, et cetera. Um, and in terms of the GIC piece, um, there is a requirement when if if it goes to the final panel, there's we have to be able to show that beyond a five percent savings on plan design change, we can achieve an extra five percent on GIC by moving into the GIC. So basically, when we get to that final, if there's a, if we aren't able to reach an agreement with the PEC, if we go to the next phase. Uh, we have to we de we have to be able to demonstrate a 10 percent savings to the city which would be um you know 10 million dollars uh, you do the math so it would be significant so but again it still keeps that conversation between employees it's just frames it in a different way and it, and it creates a more streamlined process for the city and and uh you know it does give us more control over plan design change but we have to be able to show that we can save uh, money and we also have to be able to present a plan that mitigates the impact on employees and those are some of the concessions that you described in the in the compromises that were reached about the legislation so Councilor uh, Tacey yeah, um, I guess every day is a learning curve I had uh, absolutely no idea that this almost this entire council had uh, health insurance for the city and I think um, that the city is pretty generous it may be overly generous. I know that when I have part-time employees, I don't offer them any, any health insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, I, just find it, I, I just find it astounding. And uh, I do not partake in the city's health uh, insurance. And um, I just uh, wanted to throw that out there. I just, uh, 
Maybe there are some ways we can cut health insurance costs. This is my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Councilor? Yes, Mayor. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about a health analysis, an, a health person to come in and analyze so what, structure. So what, Explain, I would like to know who so, that would be. So what we, we, currently, um, we currently use a firm that helps us when we do our health insurance uh, shopping, for lack of a better term, we go out to try to figure out what are the health insurance plans. So we use a, uh, a vendor that, that they, what they do is they take a look at our, um, at our current plan, they take a look at our, um, uh, you know, our, our, our history over the, over the previous 12 months, and they go out and seek quotes from other vendors. That's been the process that we've used, and we work with the IAC. We sometimes will bring those vendors to the IAC, and they'll present different plans, et cetera. So, um, so again, what we would do is we would do that same thing. We'd be looking at are there plan design changes we could make that would yield savings, and we'd also have them do an analysis of the GIC. If we were moving to the GIC, knowing what we know about our, our employees and what the GIC costs are, what would be the potential savings? We've already had them do some analysis of that. Um, it's a little, the range is, the potential range is, anywhere from like four to 10%, but there's a lot of variables because there's multiple plans. You don't know, you have to kind of guess how many employees will go into what plan. Um, for example, we have Health New England right now. They have Health New England and the GIC, exactly. which is a, so we may they find- They have Blue Cross, I think. I don't, Blue Cross is not in the GIC. They're one of the hold out, they're not in the GIC right now. They're, they're a separate plan, but there's Tufts, there's, there's you know, several Health of the New big England name insurance companies. So, so we'd have, we would do that analysis, and again, we have to present that analysis as part of the process, and we have to show the, 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 the background for that analysis for the potential cost savings. So it's Fallon, Harvard, Health New England, Neighborhood Health Plan, and Tufts, and Unicare are, yeah. the, are the plans they have. So, Councilor. Just for you, the uh, <coughs> average fa family health plan is $15,450 a year. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Just want to throw it out. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know how much we pay per family, what the city ends up paying. I don't, haven't, haven't got a clue. It's about twelve to 13000 Yeah. 80, we pay 80%. So, so you pay 80% of that $15,000. That's correct. Councilor. Well, I, I think this is a good point. It's something we should bring up. It's something that's been discussed at, at other times. And one would be the fact that for health insurance, our health insurance is, if people know we get $5,000 a year at salary, well, and many of us get 12000 for our family health insurance. So it is a paying I think job. It is, it is paying, well, $17,000. Um, I'm not sure it's paying well enough, but I do think it's unfair that some counselors don't get that benefit. And I'm not sure that benefit is out of whack. So it's something we could look at for both the council and for the school committee to say maybe we need to increase the salary but not have the health insurance piece. But I think that's a, a, a lengthy discussion on whether we should do that. Councilor, uh, Council President. I, I, I'm included the gist of the concern, and I think that uh, President Carlson suggested and, and, and or presented in that, and that Councilor Carney is representing is the, uh, the concern about the camel's nose under the tent. Uh, and I think this is also done in the environment that we, we are all aware of, the, the diminishing of public sector union strength and and essentially uh, but the thing is I don't th I, I'm concerned that 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 be extended to us as being considered you know, like a Wisconsin throw over of, of union systems I mean I actually I on the other hand believe that the insurance is more than appropriate I mean I think because the salaries are predicated on uh, the salaries for public sector workers as Councilor Carney pointed out predicated on the insurance benefits. The salaries are not commensurate with the jobs offered. That 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 perk is what makes the offset. And I think that obviously that would be that would come at some enormous concern for bargaining units. And I and and to some extent this is this is changing the aspect of uh, one aspect of collective bargaining um, because it does. I mean. One of the things that's, that's hamstrung mayor, this mayor and mayor's previous, is that the time frame in which we have to have a commitment and uh, to a health insurance policy does not necessarily lend itself. There are other forces that certainly don't lend itself 
to the long slog, an appropriate slog, uh, involved in all collective bargaining systems. So, I mean, it's, and clearly the, the numbers are reflected on the screen, $10 million out of $76 million, a significant portion of the budget. But, I mean, so that, I, I'm framing the context and, I, and, and framing the dilemma that is presented to us. I mean, actually, we could have got copped an easy way out of this because we said we have a conflict. But I have a conflict. I can't believe this. But I think, it's, I think it's important that we own this vote when we come to it. And, uh, and the fact is, this is our one bite of the apple. This is the one point that we get to debate and deliberate this. This is the one point that actually we have the decision and the responsibility of that decision is on us. So uh, on one hand, I actually subscribe to proceeding with caution and, and certainly information. I, I, I've been reading up on this rather extensively, but I, I don't know if all the counselors are quite up to Certainly, I'm not up to Councilor Carney's speed by any stretch of the imagination. This is what she lives and breathes. But, uh, and and the same with the mayor. But, um, I, you are, uh, are you? I got the sense that you're expressing this because there, as you point out, there is kind of a, a deadline at least that you've established for yourself in this in this process. Mm -hmm. Um, December. In terms of why I brought it forward, right, now. brought it forward well, now, and then I do want to look. I do want to look at the GIC. I do, right. I do want to seriously look at it, and so I want to be able to backing up from that December first deadline. If I if we wanted to notify the GIC, then we have to notify them by December first. So, and again, can't can't even get to that point without this framework. So right. Essentially, essentially so we I have a box that we're giving you permission to look inside that box. Yeah. Right. And, and that's. And and uh, and if after we vote no, then you can't explore this. Uh, you know, we can try to explore the GIC through the older system that very few communities took right. advantage of because it was so cumbersome. I mean, that they they created a process for people to move into the GIC, and then they were wondering why nobody was doing it because it was just a, it was a well, really I, difficult process. This is so this has been an ongoing problem. discussion, the MMA, yeah. for 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 quite a I while. Don't know. And the, and, and the fact is that the aggregate pools, of course, and the power, as you no noted, that the state enjoyed, as it were, for state administrators were able to say, we have a huge amount of uh, customers here. We get, to, we get to dictate our terms a little better. And, and the municipalities were always resentful of the fact that they didn't have an opportunity to buy in that. Yet there was a mandated insurance requirement, which, by the way, state mandate, Romney Care. I don't know if you heard about it, but it was in you know, all the papers. And the... And the so the so you're con you you want the opportunity to in proceed and investigate and look into this box, but at this point, once we give you that authorization, the author uh, all other decisions are yours. That is correct. Right. As they as they are now, with exactly. respect to collective yeah. bargaining right. about health insurance and and um, right. I mean, th this is unique. I mean. Frequently, these question, this question wouldn't even come before a council, to, uh, an elected body, to vote on uh, the disposition. Well, this is a local. This is a new local option law yeah. that requires local adoption before you can engage in it. So okay. Uh, thank I, you. I, I was just interested. I think that was one of the other parts of the legislation that was a compromise that, to allow it to be a community by community decision. So, mm -hmm. Councilor Tacey. So, if we have seven on the council that. Invoke the rule of necessity and six, 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 six. Yes, that's and correct. Then that's all that's required. Uh, that's a super majority. So if I were to bring a motion or to save some money, because it's all about saving money. If I were to bring a motion forward that we change the code that the city council is not offered a health insurance policy, how far would that go? In terms of uh, as far as a vote. That's what I'm, I'm kind of curious. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, I think I think you're, you need to stay on the motion that we're debating right well, yeah. now. But it's all about the same thing. We're talking about saving money. You're talking about different plans and this and that. Uh, we've gone up. We've doubled our health insurance costs in in ten years. You could certainly. I think it's all part. I think it's all part of the conversation. Yeah, and I think that would be. We could check into the whether that. I, I would assume that a vote on that would require the same. A hundred thousand dollars. Similar would require the similar. Uh, Issue around the conflict of interest. We'd have to we check with the city. Exactly, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, but that would have to be I assume you'd want to do that noticed and do it separately as a separate ordinance etc it's not really I'll be in to talk to you exactly and point of information this is actually uh, debated and discussed in the course of the charter um, the charter rules and uh, the committee I think um, decided not to proceed forward with that at this point but to in fact actually allow it to be uh, discussed and debated as we we set up our own rules and conditions and terms so but but I would also argue that um, it would also take into consideration discussion of stipends it also took into it also takes into consideration how you limit and restrict um, the ability for people to run and serve in office for the same reason they can teach same thing so all those considerations come up in that debate and actually we're off topic at this point in, in, in that respect because it's, that's not necessarily germane to this issue and, and arguably we'd be voting our own best interest to authorize as opposed to oppose so it's interesting our conflict actually represents the opposite of what people might project on this Either, I mean, and maybe that's your point I don't know Councillor Freeman Daniel Councillor Carney Okay, um, I would actually entertain or make a motion that we continue this until such point as we've been able to not only do outreach to the number of bargaining units, but ask, specifically ask for their input and response out of respect for the fact that we've sat at the table with them on numerous occasions and worked out and taken trade-offs regarding health insurance and wages and many other things out of the you know respect and loyalty for uh, uh, workers of the city of Northampton so is that a motion sure so yes. is the motion to to continue postpone. until such time as the mayor's office has been able to do outreach and receive response from the various I, I, so date certain I think you need to postpone it to another to yeah. a date of some <clears throat> kind in order for that to happen the next meeting you can certainly postpone it to that. So there's a motion on the floor to postpone until the next consideration until the next meeting. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion or questions about that particular motion? Council. Well, I get to say this twice in one evening. This is the reason we have a second reading. Um, I think we could vote on it in the first reading. And partially, uh, I would say that I think the second reading, and again, we can always postpone to a date certain or a date indefinite on the next reading. I think there's something about taking a first reading that raises the level of the conversation. It, it's in the newspaper. It moves it along. It moves the process along because there's <coughs> nothing like a vote to get people to say, what did you vote on last night? I can't believe you voted for that. I think it, so I think it's an important thing. And I think that's the reason we have the first and the second reading because it actually gives us time where it's not just it's it's not a it, it it gets much more public input i certainly get much more calls after i've taken a vote on something people say i didn't even know you were voting on that so that's been my experience with it and i would be happy the next time to to entertain you know postponing it to another date certain on the second reading but i once again say let's use that which is instituted in our process um i'll withdraw huh. So the amendment's been withdrawn. Choice. Back to the main motion. Councillor Tacey. I just intend to abstain. I just don't. Uh... Okay. <laughs> Councillor Freeman Daniels. Uh, I, um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm not going to echo. I'm not going to repeat everything that was previously said. I, I just think, uh, you know, if I were, if I were a, a, a union president or in a union, I would not feel uh, very comfortable with this. I wouldn't be in favor of it, um, simply because it is taking away from some of my ability to bargain. Um, but as a counselor, I have to also see, look at the health insurance that uh, expenses, which have been a budget buster. Um, and uh, I, so I, I intend to, to, uh, to vote to adopt because of um, some of the compromise that the state uh, has already put in, into place. I, I think that's a, it was a, it was favorable to uh, to both the, the idea about controlling costs and also to share some of that, those cost uh, containment mechanisms with the uh, very employees who are affected. So, um, you know, this is one one time where um, you know you, you, ha you have to embrace a compromise that maybe you didn't even work out, but uh, 
if it if it can be partially to your benefit, partially to the city's benefit, and partially to the employee's benefit, uh, then I, I'm 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 intending on voting to adopt it. Any other uh, comments or discussion on this on first reading? Okay. Roll call. Okay. So there's been a request for a roll call. So this is on first reading. All those in favor, please state aye, and I'll ask the aye. clerk to call the roll. Councilor Carney? No. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Abstain. Councilor Adams? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So by a vote of seven yes, one no, and one abstention, it is adopted on first reading. Um, I take uh, Councilor Carney's uh, advice very seriously and we'll follow up on that. Um, and, uh, and when this comes back to us on second reading, we can report back on some of that. Okay, so that uh, that is on first reading. So the next item, uh, getting back to the agenda, this is a um, okay. This is uh, this is the transfer of land. This is upon the recommendation of Conservation Commission and Councilor Maureen Carney. Uh, now, therefore, be it ordered that the City Council authorizes the Mayor to execute a deed transferring the care and custody of above referenced land to the Conservation Committee, and. Uh, and that the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and pass recreation purposes um, under the various chapters of general law that we went through earlier. Uh, is there a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, so there's been a motion made and seconded. This is a, um, because it involves a land acquisition, I will ask the clerk to call a counselor. So I, I just a brief comment. Um, Again, I'm, I'm going to emphasize my uh, mild discomfort with uh, authorizing conservation restrictions where we don't know which body will hold them uh, and, uh, and what the specifics of the conservation restrictions will be. Um, I've worked, I've, I've uh, actually, Councillor Schwartz and I sat with, uh, with Director Fiden and uh, we have sort of a tentative arrangement to have a report, an annual report on uh, the conservation restrictions granted and who holds them. But uh, um, but I, I, and I do hope we, we get that because it, as the director indicated earlier, uh, many of these restrictions are bundled and put out, I guess, to some sort of bid or procurement process. And, um, you know, we, we really do write a, a blank check to the Conservation Commission. They can specify what they like in the conservation restrictions and they can grant it to uh, entities that uh, <coughs> have all sorts of um, management powers over city land. So I, I really do wish that we could increase the scrutiny on these, but uh, I, I do, um, for now, I, I don't really have enough of, uh, of any good policy to suggest, so I'm going to <laughs> vote to approve. Okay, any other comment? So all those in favor say aye, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on this. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Charney? Yes. I believe we were going to pursue two readings on this, on this particular item, because of the... This is the Trant, the Marcinowski property. Okay, fine. Okay, we'll go ahead. One's fine. What's that? Okay, so that's fine. We'll bring this back to you. I'd actually like to take out of order because we have some folks who have been patiently waiting um, to present an order. I'd like to I'd like to skip ahead and take an order. This is the authorization. Um, this is related to the Energy and Sustainability Commission. This is in City Council upon the recommendation of Energy and Sustainability Commission, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, Councilor Pamela Schwartz, Councilor William H. Dwight, and Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels. Ordered that, whereas the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, by enacting Chapter 164 of the Acts of 1997, has established a competitive marketplace through deregulation and restructuring of the electric utility industry, 
And whereas the citizens of Northampton in Hampshire County have substantial economic, environmental, and social interests at stake, and whereas Northampton's residential and business consumers are interested in reducing their electricity rates, and whereas Northampton is committed to a 20% reduction in total community energy consumption by 2020, now therefore be it ordered, the City Council grants the Mayor authority to develop and participate in a contract or contracts for power supply and other related services is in joint action with other municipalities through the Hampshire Council of Governments. If such contracts are to be approved, individual consumers would retain the option not to participate and to choose any alternative service they desire. And the mayor is further authorized to develop an energy plan in consultation with the Energy and Sustainability Commission and the Hampshire Council of Governments and to take any and all actions necessary to implement an aggregation program, an energy program that is consistent with this order, the requirements of the Utility Restructuring Act, and will invest between 40 and 60 percent of any annual average energy cost savings towards energy conservation and production of renewable energy in Northampton. Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Um, um, move to recognize uh, Chris Mason. Okay. And we have some other folks move as well. recognize the Representatives of the Hampshire Council of Governments, Mr. Okay. Elstein and uh, Renee. Renee. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, so is there a motion made and seconded? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So Thanks for waiting. Could we also just have a quick motion to suspend our rules to allow us to go after 11 o'clock? Because I believe we're. So yes, moved. Suspend rule 27. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Shit. Oh, <laughs> we heard from that. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, actually, I don't have much to say. I'm going to, I'm actually going to let Ken Elstein um, uh, take over since the Hampshire COG um, uh, approached the Energy Commission with this idea. It's been batted around in several meetings over the last couple of months, and it finally led into this presentation. But I'm going to let Ken introduce it. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, this is Anne, Anne Renee LaRouche, who is a resident of Northampton and our newest member of the Electricity Department in the Hampshire Council of Governments. Um, I'm Ken Elstein, um, and if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, the Hampshire Council of Governments, you'll notice the county seal, and yours is the only municipality on that. Um, <laughs> We are now starting our second 350 years, having celebrated our anniversary. Uh, at the time, it was almost, it was most of Western Massachusetts until about the War of 1812. Uh, we were reorganized as the council in 1999, following the ab abolition of most of the counties in the state. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide. Um, this is about deregulation of electricity. Um, First slide is uh, how, do, how does electricity service work now? If you think about your electricity bill there's from National Grid, there's a top half and a bottom half. The top half is delivery, which is everything from the high power lines, maintaining the poles to bring the wires into, uh, up to your home. Uh, the bottom half of the bill is supply, which is pushing the electrons through the wires. Uh, National Grid acts as the default entity for those customers, which uh, is well over 90 percent of residential customers who have not chosen an outside supplier. <clears throat> Let me say that big businesses as well as the city have, ice, have outside con contracts with outside suppliers. Um, almost no residents do, uh, and that's true statewide. Uh, which says to me that the deregulation law really hasn't worked for most people. Uh, small businesses tend to run between about 40 and 60 percent have outside suppliers. Um, next slide. What we're asking is Northampton to join 29 other cities and towns in western Massachusetts, not for the top half of the bill. No, we're not going to touch anything uh, with the delivery, but uh, how supply is purchased. And that includes uh, all or almost all of the towns that surround uh, Northampton are in uh, among the 29 towns. Um, the Hampshire Council would be buying electricity in bulk. 
Uh, our program right now uh, has, uh, will have over 100,000 people in it, which allows us to have a bulk purchasing, which is uh, considerably larger than any of our communities could do alone. Um, we would seek lower prices for those Northampton customers who are participating. And under Massachusetts general law, this would require approval by the city council, the mayor, and eventually by the State Department of Public Utilities. Um, next slide. Uh, by Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 164, Section 134A, uh, which is the paragraph that I operate under and live under, um, it's an opt-out program, which <coughs> means everybody who d has not chosen an outside supplier is automatic automatically participates. There are two reasons for this. The first is it's required under Massachusetts general law. And the second is basically an opt-in system is what we have right now, and it's been a failure. Over 90% of the people are not participating in anything else. So the only way this kind of program could work and the only way you can have bulk purchasing with tens of thousands of customers is to have this kind of plan, and that's why it's in the law. Uh, this would not, the second bullet, this would not apply to anybody who's already chosen another supplier. And as I said earlier, the city itself uh, would not be included in this program. Uh, next slide. Uh, National Grid would continue to do all delivery services. I'm not climbing any poles. Uh, uh, all question. emergencies are responsibility of National Grid. Could the, can the city opt in to the uh, Hampshire Cog, or it, can it? Is it you able? could. Um, but technically, uh, you already have contracts. There are probably penalties in the contracts. Uh, if uh, you were to choose to participate, um, you would want to wait until the end of your current contracts. Uh, on, in addition to that, as I will say in a slide or two later, uh, we have our own Hampshire Power Program in which we are uh, providing services uh, to a majority of towns and school districts in Hampshire and Franklin counties and about 20 other entities in the surrounding three counties. So in five counties, we are doing acting as a supplier. And my advice would be to talk to the other people in the electricity department who do that, because we could probably give you better prices than we would from this kind of program for a variety of reasons, which Jeff, with his fancy charts, will be able to explain to you. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. How much will this cost the city? Nothing. Uh, I've stood before town meetings, and I get applause with that line. Um, all costs are paid by the Hampshire Council, regardless of whether or not a t community is w a member of the council or is not a member of the council. So one of the key things is it has zero impact on your budget. Next slide. Have other cities and towns done this successfully? Yes. Uh, the first group in 2000 was the 21 towns on Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. They organized Cape Light Compact. Um, they have had lower electricity prices. They generally have one-year contracts. They've had lower electricity prices uh, for almost every year in the last 12 years that they've been doing this. Um, their direction is conservative. They look to just barely beat uh, NSTAR as their utility, uh, their price. But they have been successful in doing that. Uh, the item in parenthesis there on the second bullet uh, I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but we intend to do that. We are people who follow electricity prices. We follow all the DPU filings. We follow what National Grid is doing every day. And we expect, particularly through uh, the very supportive legislative delegation we have here in Western Massachusetts, um, to uh, pay attention to all of the other stuff other than the rates, uh, which is what uh, we're proposing tonight. So tonight we're talking about prices, but there's a lot of other stuff that goes into energy, and we pay attention to it, and we will be rep representing the participating communities in those actions, too, as Cape Light does. Uh, City of Marlboro did it by itself in 2006. They've had a successful record uh, in those five years. They've beaten the national grid price in their case, uh, I think four out of five years. Uh, and we have filing with 28 towns and cities uh, in, Ma in uh, Western Massachusetts. Our first public hearing before DPU was in, uh, on August 1st. We have another uh, set of conversations, a lot of paperwork, uh, a lot of lawyer type stuff. 
uh, that's going in next week. And we're expecting to be able to uh, get approval late this year and, and turn on the juice uh, early next year. Um, next slide, please. Okay, yes, we are new. Do we have anything, does the Hampshire Council have anything to do with electricity? Uh, yes, since 2006 we've been supplying to over 100 customers. Uh, we also serve the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, several nonprofits, libraries and the like, and some small businesses. Uh, the last bullet I'm particularly uh, pleased with because I'm a Belchtown selectman, and we have saved about 15 percent on our electric bill, uh, which is $400,000 we got in real early. Um, and, you know, figure two-thirds of that was for the school. So that, that's like a teacher or two just by changing your electric supplier. Um, uh, we have an estimate from Deerfield who went through their bills carefully that they've saved about 15 percent over the years. This is a much more aggressive program than the one we're talking about, and it's uh, to answer Councillor Freeman Daniels' question. It would be better for you to go with that program for the t city, um, but um, there are good reasons that uh, we, we don't want to have that kind of aggressive program for residents. Uh, though we may open that up as an option in year two or year three. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, do we have a track record on the renewable energy program? Again, the answer is yes. We have a sustainability department, uh, which is going in a whole number of different directions. We're a licensed broker of solar renewable energy certificates, RECs, uh, SRECs. Um, we have a program in which we uh, did an RFP with 39 towns and school districts asking where they would want photovoltaic, uh, and we've gotten bids on most of them. I, I think every single town has at least one bid. Uh, some bidders are only interested in the roofs of schools. Some are interested in, in uh, uh, dumps or former dumps. Um, but it's, it's been, uh, it's, it's looking very good and we're probably going to be building a lot of that or cooperating in, in with uh, local contractors in, in building a lot of that. Uh, we also do some sustainability, green energy consulting, uh, uh, green communities. Uh, I'm glad to say that I received the big check the same day your mayor uh, uh, received the big check um, for uh, green communities, uh, but we're helping some of the really tiny towns in, in becoming green communities, and we have a net metering program. Uh, next slide. Uh, will this program include programs to expand renewable generation and sustainability in Northampton? And this is really where uh, most of the conversations took place with uh, your Energy and Sustainability Commission. Um, the first bullet, residents who choose not to opt out will automatically be directly investing in local, and by local we're talking about Northampton local, uh, conservation and renewable projects, uh, even as they take advantage of lower prices. And the way that's done is approximately one half of the price benefits, uh, I think the uh, resolution reads approximately 40 to 60 percent, will be directly invested in local conservation and renewable energy projects. Uh, this is something we will have to review with the city uh, and uh, together going to the Department of Energy Resources, who have never heard of a plan like this before, and certainly the Department of Public Utilities, the State Attorney General. Um, it was my sense, and I, I probably shouldn't be speaking for your own commission, but they, wanna, they want Northampton to take the lead on this. And uh, uh, this is certainly uh, going to be a way of doing it, and uh, we very much hope that uh, working together we'll be successful in this. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Greenup, but Northampton customers who choose to will be able to buy a, uh, an all green option uh, for approximately two cents uh, per kilowatt hour, similar to uh, National Grid's Green Up program. Uh, and again, these would be directly invested in uh, local, meaning uh, Northampton conservation and renewable projects. Uh, next slide. All right, what about existing Green Up pro customers? There was a big effort made here uh, oh, five or six years ago to sign up people for Green Up. And at the time, there was state money that uh, was given to the city for every customer who signed up. Um, that money has since dried up. Um, 
but uh, we would like the customers to have automatically and seamlessly been brought into our program. Uh, DPU made a decision back in 2006 with the Marlboro case that that would not take place, and though we're ready to argue that question, which probably was never debated before DPU, um, assuming that we don't win on that, uh, the current customers would need to join our program. Um, the current Green Up program basically bu buys these renewable energy certificates. These are pieces of paper that say mostly that there were projects before 1997 that were green, and that's what you're buying when you sign up for it. Like I said, we want to take this money and invest it in new projects and make them local, not somewhere in New England or somewhere in the United States. So it's a, it's a very exciting program. Now that's the, the optional green program uh, that we're talking about here, not the 50-50 split, but rather the optional is something that uh, uh, we would be offering to all of our 29 other communities. And uh, I think once we roll this out, and again, we've got to go before DOER has never heard of such a thing before, uh, will uh, really uh, make this program uh, very exciting to a lot of communities. Uh, uh, we have 29, but, you know, we are more than scalable. Um, <clears throat> so, next screen. Oh, just our name and contact information. So that's it, um, and we very much hope you participate. Now, sir. So we have not done anything together yet. That's correct. And this is a proposal? Yes. So all of this other, I'm just thinking about, we have solar farms here and there, and I just... It's all been independent of the Hampshire Council of the Government. Yes. Uh, okay. Under Massachusetts general law, the legislative body, which in this case is the city council, authorizes the executive authority, the mayor in this case, to work with us, sign a contract, and put together a plan and work first with the Department of Energy Resources and the DPU. And so we would be working with you, collaborating, uh, and uh, running the program once it's approved. So you're familiar with our, the Smith School solar farm? I'm f vaguely familiar with it, but I'm not saying it. Are you? I, is that something that we're in that general idea? Yes. We're, well, we're, we're doing something similar on the, the Smith, right, Smith uh, farm. We produce our own solar renewable energy. You should step to the mic. So that, yeah. Thank you. With the, uh, with the Smith Volk um, photovoltaic array, we produce our, our own solar renewable energy cer certificates, and we market them on the open market. Um, so far, we're trying that internally to see how well it works. We've actually done pretty well so far. Um, and I know that Hampshire COG also <laughs> aggregates uh, renewable energy certificates and sells them. Uh, and we are keeping an eye on what prices they're getting in case that we, they can help us out better. And so. Uh, we're keeping an eye on it, but at the moment we got a really good price, so we've been doing it ourselves. So not only the, the price of us buying energy, uh, maybe us selling energy back. Uh, yes, they they aggregate the sale of these SRECs from local photovoltaic arrays around the area. So you know, if you own a, a, a photovoltaic array on your house, you don't want to be involved in selling these things in the open market. I mean, that's just way too much of a hassle for the little bit you have. And you're not going to get a good price because it's a very small amount. Hampshire Cog aggregates those into a big pool and sells them. Uh, and uh, if we added in, we would add a pretty big pool because we already have a big pool. 100 kilowatts is a pretty big, pretty big batch. So this pool is growing, and as we as, as you as you or this community or the surrounding area puts more and more of these photovoltaic arrays together, is that? Yes, but, look the, at this as, as but this is. The, Yes is the answer to your question, but the main thrust of this is providing, becoming the default supplier of electricity to residences and businesses. Um, we also are doing lots of sustainability, as you are. We, this program has these add-ons, um, both the, the optional green program, approximately two cents per kilowatt hour for those who want are, are want to participate, as well as this 50-50 split, um, those are add-ons. But the main thrust of it, I mean, you know, the overwhelming majority of the money in this program will be to pay for ordinary electricity. Okay. 
And on top of that, we're doing a lot of other stuff. Uh, Thank you. We have experience. Councilor Dwight. Actually, it's interesting that this comes on the heels of a conversation about um, insurance pools, but it's the very same thing. It's uh, the aggregate power has much greater strength to negotiate better rates. I mean, on every level, as as, as Chris had mentioned, if you if you're getting if you're getting an S rec from your 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 solar panel on your garage, the time and energy invested to get the little return is not worth it. But in the aggregate, it's much better, and it's why there's a benefit to. You know, for the same reason, jar joining larger insurance pools is because you get to you, people pay more attention to you when you're negotiating those rates. Um, the Cog has been doing this for a while. This has become uh, this has become their their uh, their bailiwick, and the added appeal to this is all the green energy investment that we're talking about in return. Uh, because and and as Ken had said, I mean one of the one of the points of pride here is actually we're taking the lead in some sense. Um, we're we're making life a little more difficult for him, I know, but as a result. But the fact is is that we are saying in the course of if we accept this in our commitment that we're devoted to not only um, the sources of energy, the green sources of energy, but reducing our consumption of it. And, but the most important thing for the individual customers in the community is reducing the price that they're paying for the energy that they're paying now. Uh, currently, it's basically you get an electric bill. You pay, you pay the electric bill. Do you remember signing up with uh, National Grid? No, you didn't, it just sort of the bill showed up when you got the house, I guess. And the thing is, is that now there's an opportunity for the, the citizens of Northampton. There is an opt out. But the fact is, is that we now actually have a little more say. We're asking for more say, not only in where we get our energy from, but what the investments that we're going to make about making us a very green community. And we want to, we want to be, uh, we, we, we actually want to set the bar. Now that's maybe we're a little arrogant. Maybe you know, little tiny Northampton is trying to set the bar, but we're actually trying to be pace setters. And I think by the proposal, if we accept it as presented. That we have an opportunity to show other people in the state this can be done, and it can be done really well, and that uh, hopefully there's enough groups around there who will recognize what we're doing, and then and uh, we become a, and then Ken gets to become a juggernaut and a, and a master, and our rates go go down consequently. Uh, Councilor, did you? I just love the term "very green community." I think we should patent it. <laughs> I don't think somebody's already looked into that. <laughs> Councillor Freeman Daniels. Uh, obviously, as a co-sponsor, I support this uh, move. I think it's uh, a great way to regionalize, and I, I really like the I like regionalization. I like pooling resources, uh, especially because for such a small state, we have how many 300 some odd 351 cities and towns, and so on. So, any way to uh, have a larger buying power, I think, is very important. Um, as far as the investment in uh, in other green initiatives and conservation, I think it's also really good. I mean, obviously, we only win if the ratepayers in Northampton win. So, if we don't recognize savings, we're not we're not going to take from their bill. Uh, oh, we only do we the, the city only adds to its um, its uh, uh, initiatives if there are savings, and and uh, some of the savings are returned to the ratepayers, and some of the savings are are uh, are retained by the city to invest in. The very green community that we're going to do, uh, be pursuing, and then finally, uh, as far as opt out, opt in. I mean, this is a a, a debate that uh, economists have, or gladly economists have, that a rational choice model should there should not be a difference between opt out and opt in. So, uh, I'm very comfortable with an opt out process. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, you're asking for the council to approve tonight. Uh, obviously, then there's still a, a, an agreement that has to be reached right. overall with the city, and then it still has to go to the Department of Public Utilities who has to approve. So it's the the DOA, DOA, Department of Energy Resources first, and then Department of Public Utilities. Okay. So this is the first step in a. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions uh, for any of our guests tonight about this? This is a. This will be first reading. It'll come back to you for second reading. Um, okay. Any we're not actually signing anything tonight. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. So all those in favor of adopting this uh, this order on first reading say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions?
Okay, so it's been adopted on first reading unanimously, and it'll come back to the council for a second reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for uh, staying with us. Thank so you late. for extending the deadline. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd like to say you're welcome. But, uh, <laughs> uh, now, they'll be buying net green energy from like Mount Tom. Uh, I, I'm not sure okay. of the specifics. Um, okay, so the next, I'm going to return back to the regular order. Uh, the next is. Uh, Upon the recommendation of the Office of Planning and Development, ordered that whereas the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan 2008 adopted by the City Council and Planning Board <coughs> sets goal H2, preserve and sustain existing affordable housing and an objective under that goal, identify the present affordable housing at risk, e.g. expiring use and rentals that might be converted to condominiums, and work with property owners and others to identify and secure funding sources to preserve the units as affordable. Whereas the new South Street Apartments, formerly known as the Hafey Block, 22 to 34 New South Street contain 18 dwelling units with an affordability restriction covering most of the units expiring on December 31st, 2028. And whereas, as part of an agreement with the city and using CDBG funds, but no other city funds, the property owner has agreed to grant a new affordability restriction to the city, extending affordability for 25 years to December 31st, 2053. Now, therefore, be it ordered that City Council authorizes the mayor to accept and execute an affordable housing restriction extending affordability. Move to approve. Second. Is there a second? Um, uh, Councilor Murphy. It's a question. How much money is involved in this purchase? Uh, Wayne. Wayne, to recognize you. He's been recognized already. He's been recognized. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have the exact number. It's in the neighborhood of sixty thousand dollars, sixty thousand or fifty thousand. But I have to look it up exactly what it is. So, this belongs to Valley CDC, right? Uh, well, their partnership in it. I think would be a different LLC, but essentially, yes, it's them, and it's already affordable to twenty twenty eight. And these are the nice folks that sued us over the defunct hotel project and hit us up there. I mean, I don't see a compelling reason to do this anytime soon. We got till 2028. It's not going anywhere. It burns down in 10 years. God forbid. Why do we want to give them? I give them sixty thousand dollars today for something that's going to be affordable for another 15 years. And if it's even still there, we could do it at that point. So this was part of the settlement for their lawsuit. So the issue was they sued over the hotel, and. They said they want lots of money because the hotel or any development would damage their property. And the mayor at the time, Claire Higgins, said, you know, we don't think you have any grounds for a lawsuit, and so we don't want to settle. And then the, the final solution that came up is it, what the mayor said is, well, you know, we're worried that what, you re what you're really interested in is preserving your right to convert this condominium that you don't want a hotel there because if a hotel goes there, then you wouldn't be able to convert to a condo. And their response was, no, 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 we want to keep affordability for a long time. So the mayor's response was, great, then we'll give you money to keep affordability. And frankly, in the end, the dollar amount was, she said she would have accepted that as an application for affordab affordable housing if they hadn't sued us. So, so from her standpoint, the reason she signed the settlement was we got 25 years of affordability um, that we would have done anyways. And, the, and could I just clarify, the CDBG funding was actually used for capital improvements in the, in the, to the building? Yes. It was to pay for capital expenses in the building. So That's right. So they can't take the money out and do anything else. They have to reinvest in the property. I just wanted to clarify that point. So, so is and this money part of that original st the settlement, settlement with them? Yes. This is the only cash that went to them. This is... It was part of a $130,000 settlement. It was $65,000 twice that came out of CDBG money. The first year it came out was three years ago. Last year we didn't have the $65,000, so we got an extension for another year, and we just put the last $65,000 in. It was the result of the settlement agreement with the, with the city of Hitman and MH MHIC, I think, a Sandra Blackman was the... Um, 
designee from uh, the company in Boston that owns the, the building. So it was all a result of the settlement, and the money was to be used for the 25-year affordable restriction, and but the money that we gave them for the restriction was supposed to be used for capital improvements in the building. That's correct. It's going to be used for capital. Again. That's, that's right. Restriction until 2028. So I'm trying to figure out, are we giving them more money now? And the, by the way, it's Hafey, H-A-F-E-Y, on the, the black, the name. Um, so I'm, just, I'm, I'm curious, is this more money again? So this is the money agreed to in the original settlement. Uh, I'm not familiar with the piece we gave him some money in the past, because again, I don't remember the dollar amount. Um, but this is, this is what the original agreement was that, that the mayor signed. I know it was $130,000 that we gave them in two, two installments. We haven't given the second piece, then. This is the second installment. This is the second installment. So it was in last year's CDBG budget, um, but the funds weren't released partially because they weren't ready and partially because we didn't have the affordability restriction. So we haven't released those funds yet. Council, I know we voted for those. Let me get this clear. It's, if it's CDBG funds, it's solely within the mayor's purview. That's correct. CDBG budget comes to you and you guys endorse it, which your right, mayor isn't required to. Right, the mayor. So that's already been in what you've endorsed. Okay, that's and correct. we've already voted on a budget, on a light item in a budget as well. It's not no, it's not on a budget. Okay. It shows up in the so annual resolution. CDBG money. Right. That's correct. So then, I, I think I may be echoing the sentiments of the councilor from Ward 5, what are we voting on? You're voting to accept the restriction. So that's Board background. Board. We don't okay. need a new appropriation. So the city's, the city's paid for it. The city's done it. It's just a matter of whether the council wants so to accept, accept the, the sweetener. That's right. Correct. So let's accept this. I, I'm in favor of accepting yeah. the sweetener. Now <laughs> that the money's right. been yeah. spent. <laughs> I just want to know what we're accepting. I don't want to be passed them any more money. It's gone already. Right. This is, in fact, the second installment of the money. I'm, I'm we can we can favor. we can try to verify all that between now and second reading. Please, we can certainly do that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I hope it doesn't burn down. <laughs> <laughs> On that cherry note, vote. <laughs> On the first reading. I just had a visual. I call a question. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor on first reading say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so this will come back to you on second reading. Okay, so um, the next order before you is a set of ordinances that require referrals. Um, the first is an ordinance to amend section 22-19 on the recommendation of Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels. Uh, and this affects the Northampton Transportation and Parking Commission uh, powers and duties. It's requesting a referral to uh, the planning board. There's been a request that it be referred to the planning board. This Owen came from her. In addition to the other, it was already referred to okay. directly to ordinance and at ordinance um, we thought that we should hear from also the planning board okay. since they uh, they presently um, um, weigh in on the uh, traffic mitigation uh, plan as it was described earlier. So we just thought they should have some say before it comes back to us at ordinance. Councilor? Well, it hasn't been moved. Okay. I, so I would move it. Okay. Second. So there's, there's motion now made and seconded. Now. So I, I, um, I think I'm probably in the minority here, but I disagree that it, this should be referred to the planning board. Uh, we had this discussion actually last time. Uh, the zoning, the, this, this uh, policy change is actually two different ordinances. One is in zoning, and another is in powers and duties of the Transportation and Parking Commission. Uh, and so we did refer the zoning element to the planning board. The council did refer the zoning element to the planning board. I, I don't understand why 
the council believes it's relevant to ask the planning board to specify to give its recommendation about the rule about the powers and duties of the transportation and parking commission these are the, the transportation and parking commission is a separate body it's controlled by the ordinance and this council uh, I don't understand why the planning board would ever recommend what powers and duties the transportation and parking commission would have so I'm I don't support this I think it's I, I, I think it's a it's a um, it's a bad uh, a balance of powers uh, a referral. Councilor Murphy? I believe transportation and parking is looking to take some authority that now rests with the planning board. And ordinance was interested in what the planning board's thoughts were on that before we said, sure, let's transfer the authority. So that's why I think we wanted to send it there, was to get their input on it. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, I, um, I definitely understand that, but I disagree with that interpretation. Um, the planning board, so far as I understand, I think, as so far as the direct the director of planning told us today, the planning board sets the uh, the um, specifications and restrictions on the use of in lieu of paint in lieu of traffic mitigation payments. So, in a sense, they do it on the front end when they approve a when they approve a. Uh, a site plan uh, review, um, site plan review, or special permit, they can offer uh, uh, any kind of restrictions or, or specifications on how those, in lieu of payments, are used. Um, there has been heretofore no uh, additional process, no additional powers that any board or commission has had regarding the expenditure of those payments. Um, it hasn't been the planning board. The planning board is on the f sort of the, the, the intake <laughs> side. Um, so I, again, I don't agree that the transport that this is offering any kind of uh, any kind of um, restriction on the planning board's uh, powers because it's this is on the expenditure side that we're that we're talking, not the not the uh, fr not the uh, approval side. So again. Uh, it's a small it's a small thing to bring up at 11 whatever at night but i i just think that it's a it's a poor process to allow the planning board which already gets the, the first bite at the apple to to weigh in on the powers and duties of the trans of the transportation park commission council um just we actually were saying the more input the better it was our was our sense at that point. We didn't want the planning board to misinterpret what, what may come across as to be, and it would be great if you would come to that planning board or come to that planning board meeting and then explain that it's not your intention to deprive them of their any perceived authority. If they thought they had authority, they were wrong in the first place. So if you if you could explain that all to them, then there may be no misunderstanding and miscommunications. And that way, if when it came back to us at ordinance, we would have a full sense that it had been vetted there, and you had explained all that to them, and um, we could move forward with it in ordinance. So the motion before you is to refer this to the planning board. Is there any further discussion on it? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. Nay. Any abstentions? Okay. Um, I detected two nays and three. three nays. Three nays and six ayes. So I believe the referral is adopted. So that measure will be sent to the planning board. So, so the final two items are two, two ordinances that deal with parking, uh, section 312.102, section 312.102, dealing with Market and Bay Streets and North Street. These come to us from the Transportation and Parking Commission and the Department of Public Works, and they were both require referral to the Committee on Elections Rules for orders and Claims. So move as a group. Okay, it's been a motion second. made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of referring to ordinance say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Do we have any updates from the council president? Um, that was yesterday. I don't remember. It. Okay. Yeah. Is there any new business? Council? Well, I just, from ordinance, I just wanted to check with Mary. How many 
councilors have we heard from about making that special meeting to discuss council rules changes? Have you heard? I just heard them. Uh, the oh, maybe I didn't send you. The finance committee is meeting before that, so we're right. here anyway. So All right. <laughs> it's, yeah. No, if you had another engagement. And where's the time at 7 p.m.? It's right after after 20 finance. Yeah. In October. Which October. ends at 7? Yeah. Okay. But I know I saw the email going around for people to chime in. Could they make it? Could they make it? I will, I I will not. Many people I will not be there. Hmm? I will not be there on the 23rd. It's going to be a special meeting, right? Right. Yes. It's our special meeting to go over. To invite, or we invited everyone. Changes. And ours. Okay. So, that's, that's so thank you for that announcement. That's um, Any other oh. new business items? Um, hearing none, I would entertain a motion. We'll move. Okay. Adjourn. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. The meeting is adjourned. Aye.